Yes, comrades, when we come to analyze the present world situation, it first appears to be a very complicated web of contradictory processes. And uh, superficially, at least, uh, the, the main tendencies appear to be the very opposite of revolutionary. And impressionistic minds will draw the most pessimistic conclusions from this. But that would be a fundamental mistake. Because when we come to analyze events, we must not base ourselves on appearances, but to penetrate deeper in order to understand the underlying processes. Now, the strategists of capital are incapable of understanding the real processes taking place in society, precisely because they're hopeless empirics who only see the surface, surface of events. These people constantly appeal to the facts, give us the facts, you know, but they're incapable of seeing the deeper processes that are quietly maturing beneath the surface. In quite a literal sense, they cannot see the wood for the trees. For these ladies and gentlemen, dialectical thinking is, is, is a book sealed with seven seals. Yes, but occasionally, very occasionally, they are capable of arriving at the correct idea. Allow me to, to quote from an article from the Financial Times of the 28th of June, written by a man called Martin Wolf, who's one of the main strategists of uh, capitalism. And he writes the following. This new epoch of the world, he's referring to a new epoch, that's interesting, is creating huge challenges. It is possible, he writes, perhaps even probable, that the world system will shatter. Now, if you just look at the surface, of course, this prediction seems uh, rather improbable. But if you dig deeper, it's quite correct. And that's precisely our task as Marxists, to dig deeper using the scientific method of dialectics. Now, as you know, one of the basic laws of dialectics is the law of the transformation of quantity into quality, in which a series of small, apparently insignificant uh, changes eventually reach a critical point where there's a qualitative leap. And at a certain point, things change into their opposite. Now, it's true that the objective conditions vary from one country to another. Events can move uh, at a quicker or slower pace. That is true. But everywhere, without exception, events are moving in the same direction towards greater instability and an enormous intensification of the, of the contradictions at all levels, economic, social, and political. And most important of all, we see at least the beginning of significant changes taking place in the psychology of the masses. And that is what is preparing the way for great social and political explosion. One thing is absolutely clear. Sharp and sudden changes are implicit in the whole situation. We saw this at the beginning of the year in Kazakhstan. We're seeing it now again before our very eyes in Ecuador and particularly in Sri Lanka. Now, these are not isolated events. They're not accidents. They resemble the kind of heat lightning that announced the, the coming of a storm. Therefore, at all times, we must keep a firm grasp on the fundamental processes, not be distracted by this or that detail. And that is, is a, that's above all necessary when we come to deal with war, which Napoleon described as the most complex equation of all. Now, the dominating feature in the world situation at the present time is the war in the Ukraine. That's clear. Of course, it's, it, is, it is impossible. It's physically impossible to be precise about the timing of events in any war shouldn't even try. There are too many variables in the situation to be absolutely certain. But you know, there's an old saying, if you play with fire, you're quite likely to get your fingers burnt. And this excellent advice appears to have been forgotten by the bourgeoisie and its, uh, its strategists. Yeah. Now they're learning the lesson the hard way. Now, what is the Marxist attitude towards war? It's a, nothing in common with, with the uh, stupid uh, uh, moralistic nonsense of the pacifists who, who tell us uh, as if we didn't know that war is a very bad thing because people get killed as if we didn't know this 
But you know, Marxists, Marxists cannot adopt a sentimental or moralistic attitude towards war. It's out of, completely out of place. Whether you like it or not, war is a fact of life. And it serves, it, that's true, it does serve a useful purpose in as much as it accelerates the processes, bringing all the contradictions to a critical point. And the Ukrainian events uh, are no exception to this. The Ukrainian war has served to sharply define all existing tendencies, starting with the, with the Social Democrats, the right-wing reformists, of course, who immediately jumped on, on, the, on the chariot of imperialism and of NATO. And as usual, the cowardly left reformists have been dragged behind the right wing, incapable of playing any, any independent role. They've all fallen for the hypocritical propaganda of the imperialists, weeping crocodile tears about the fate of the poor Ukrainians. Yeah. We are the first people to, to sympathize with, with the plight of the, uh, the terrible plight of the poor civilians in the Ukraine. Yeah. Are we not prepared to fall for this disgraceful propaganda? These people do not grasp this, the self-evident fact that the, in, in, this, in this war, the Ukrainians are merely pawns in the hands of US imperialism, that's all. And when, if we speak of the Ukrainian regime, the government, then a reactionary pawn, pawns into the pawns into the bargain. But if, in, 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 an inter interesting case is Germany, where the most rabid uh, warmongers are actually the Greens, who in the past considered themselves to be pacifists, and now you see these petty bourgeois pacifists have immediately jumped into the camp of imperialist reaction. Oh yes, my friends, yes, things do change into their opposite, don't they? And what have we got to say about the so-called Trotskyist sects, who likewise surrendered to the pressure of imperialism and the hysterical propaganda of the media? Oh, yes, indeed, war is very useful in laying bare all the contradictions and mercilessly exposing the weaknesses of those who falsely claim to be left-wing, and even worse, those who claim to stand, stand for the ideas of Lenin and Trotsky. And we can be proud of the fact that, that our international, the, the IMT, has kept its head and stood firm against uh, all, all the hysterical, warmongering barrage. Let us speak clearly. There's absolutely no room in our ranks for weak elements who bend under, the, under, under, under pressure in wartime. We do, not have, we do not have one policy for wartime and another totally different policy for peacetime. We don't have that. We always pursue the same line, the same policy, and that's a class policy. We're told that Vladimir Putin is our enemy. Oh, yes, Putin is our enemy. Yes, he is, of course. But the task of settling accounts with Putin lies with the Russian working class and only with the Russian working class. The idea that NATO and imperialism can represent a progressive alternative to Putin is a blatant and appalling lie. Our task is to fight against our own bourgeoisie and our own imperialist ruling class, not to be pushed directly or indirectly into an alliance with them on the grounds that we must fight against the evil Putin. However evil he, may, he might be, the ladies and gentlemen in Washington and London are a thousand times more evil and counter-revolutionary. Their hands are stained with far more blood, by the way. And therefore, we must stand always firmly for class politics and uphold the basic Leninist principle. The real enemy is at home. That's the essential point. Yeah. We must not lose sight of it for a single second. <laughs> now, so there's some, uh, you know, even, even in, a, in a horrible situation like this, there, there is some elements of unconscious humor. Everybody knows that NATO is entirely, con is an aggressive imperialist alliance controlled by US imperialism. Everybody knows this. But it's quite amusing to see that the public face of NATO is never an, an American, never, ever. It's always a nice Scandinavian gentleman. Why? Well, because everybody knows that Scandinavians are nice, peaceful folk who abhor war and or violence of any kind. So General Jens Stolenberg, that flint-faced Norwegian who pretends to be the General Secretary of NATO, he announced that, but with great pleasure that uh, and more Scandinavians were going to join this gang. Sweden and Finland were going to join. Uh, after Because Turkey had withdrawn its objections. Yes, he didn't say why Turkey had withdrawn its objections. In reality, this was a sordid deal with Erdogan. He put a pistol to the head, to the head of NATO and gave them an alternative. 
Well, or in the words of Marlon Brando, he made them an offer they couldn't refuse. Throw the Kurds to the wolves or forget about Sweden and Finland joining NATO. And they soon made their mind up. President Erdogan's office said that, that it had got what it wanted. You may have noticed a couple of days ago, Turkish artillery bombarded a tourist resort in northern Iraq, killing men, women, and children, innocent civilians. Now, just imagine if it had been the Russians doing something like, something like that in, in, in the Ukraine. Imagine the outcry, the indignation about the barbarity of killing innocent women and children. Where was the condemnation of Sweden and Finland, of Washington and London? Nothing, of course, nothing. Only a deafening silence. This action in and of itself exposes the complete cynicism and hypocrisy of both the main imperialist powers and those sniveling Scandinavian scoundrels who hide behind the, the fake facade of democracy, neutrality, and pacifism. Let me leave them alone. Now, on the war itself, it is certainly true that Putin made an, initially made a mistake. He thought he would take Kiev in a very short space of time. I must put my hand up and plead guilty. I, I thought the same thing. And I wasn't the only one. The CIA and the Pentagon had exactly the same perspective. That's why they sent a helicopter to Zelensky to offer to fly him out of the country. But things turned out differently. The Ukrainian army, which used to be a, an insignificant force, but armed, with NATO, armed and trained by NATO, it turned out to be quite a serious, serious fighting force. And the Russians had to abandon their original aims and operate on the basis of a more, of a more realistic plan, namely to take over the Donbass, which they have done. But most of it, I think they control about three quarters of it. The rest will fall in a measurable space of time. They changed their tactics, advancing slowly but surely, using the strength of their artillery to bomb the, the objectives into submission and inflicting very heavy losses on the Ukrainians, by the way. Very heavy losses which they can, the Ukrainians cannot sustain indefinitely. A recent report by Ukrainian and Western intelligence of, officials revealed that the Ukrainians are facing huge difficulty. They're suffering massive losses. They're outgunned 20 to 1 in artillery and 40 to 1 in ammunition. And the Ukrainians now admit that around 200 Ukrainian soldiers are being killed every day. That was up from 100 last month. And, and if you include those that are wounded and injured, it means that as many as 1,000 Ukrainian soldiers are being taken out of action every day. Now, this is an, uns an unsustainable position, particularly as the, the losses include mainly experienced, battle-hardened troops who are being replaced by, 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 by untrained and poorly armed conscripts. The report goes on to say that the situation in the, in the Donbass is having, quote, a seriously demoralizing effect on the Ukrainian forces. For the first time since the war began, there's now serious concern, concern about the desertion and even mutinies with the Ukrainian soldiers refusing to, to obey, to, refusing to obey orders to go into battle. Now, there's many, many I could report in detail from this interesting report, but I don't have time to do so. It's quite catastrophic. And Zelensky is, is shouting all the time for more weapons and more money. They insist that the U.S. weapons, new weapons from America, will change the course of the war. The Ukrainian defense minister, Oleksiy Reznikov, actually claims that these weapons, these new, new wonder weapons, will allow the Ukraine not, not just to seize back the occupied territory in the Donbass, but also Crimea, which, as you know, is part of the Russian Federation now. I ask myself what, what galaxy these gentlemen are living in. Ukraine now depends entirely on the military support of the USA, entirely. And Reznikov says that the, uh, that, uh, the uh, Western, Western military support for the Ukraine will never stop, quote unquote, will never stop. My friends, that, <laughs> that remains to be seen. It's true that the USA has given billions of dollars to, to the Ukraine. But this represents a very serious drain on the resources for even the wealthiest country on earth. And the Ukrainians, <laughs> instead of being grateful, they complain all the time that we're not getting enough. Here's one, I've got a good one from a Ukrainian official unnamed. He says, we are of course very grateful for our allies for their support. The new weapons are welcome, but when they announce that they are sending military aid to the Ukraine, 
The Western governments should also perhaps clarify to their public the quantities involved. In other words, it's not enough. It isn't enough. And all this nonsense about the, the wonder weapons that are going to change everything, you, you can take that with a pinch of salt. And they have some effect, of course, I don't deny that, they have some effect, but, the, but not, not, not sufficient, not sufficient to make up the huge difference that exists. The fact of the matter is that in, on the battlefield, Kiev is losing ground. Meanwhile, the, the US and its allies cannot even agree about the real aims of the war. Biden recently said that America's main goal is the preservation of a free and independent Ukraine. But that opinion is not shared by, by his main European allies, France and Germany. Olaf uh, Scholz, the Ger German chancellor, has often said that Russia must not win, but he has never said that the Ukraine must, must uh, achieve victory. And that's, a, that's an important point. France and Germany have got a similar position in this respect. Of course, we have the lunatics in London, the government of uh, lunatics, and of course the other lunatics in, in, the, in the Baltic states and Poland. Although I see the Baltics, the Lithuania just had to retreat on the question of, uh, of supplies to uh, Kalinin, Kaliningrad, isn't it? But, they, but they, 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 they're trying to, in the NATO meeting in Madrid, try to present a picture of unity. But splits, splits are opening up, both within the United States and between the US here and its European allies. Of course, they have to maintain, publicly, they, they try to maintain a, a brave face. Everyone, including Schultz and Macron, agrees, at least in public, agrees that there would be no peace deal imposed on Ukraine. But the, Ukrainians have got a, the Ukrainian regime has got a different impression altogether. They're afraid that they're going to be forced to do a peace deal and to concede the lost territory because they're not giving enough, they're not receiving enough powerful weapons to, to prevent Russia advancing on the battlefield. And by the way, advisors to Biden have already been debating internally whether Zelensky should modify his de definition of a Ukrainian victory, adjusting for the possibility that his country has, quote, shrunk irreversibly. You know, for the economic position of the Ukraine, there's no need to mention this is a complete catastrophe. One of the, the an economic advisor to, to Zelensky, called Oleg Ustenko, Ustenko, says that the country now needs nine billion dollars a month from the West. Nine billion, not not a million, nine billion dollars a month to plug it to plug its 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 budget deficit. Previously, they gave the figure of between six, five, and six billion, and if they don't get the money, they say, they'll have to they'll have to default in in September. Now, looking at it from the standpoint of the imperialists, although they would like to see uh, Russia being defeated, but that's not likely, they got big doubts about pouring more money down a black hole, and the Europeans are even less keen. In April, the European uh, Commission, the European Union, promised to give uh, 9 billion euros to the Ukraine. This is in, a, in an economic crisis, and who's going to pay, the, pay all that money? Well, the, the, the Germans, of course. Deutsche Bank, of course. Yeah. <laughs> the Germans are not very happy about it. They're not very keen about that for some reason. So they blocked it. So the Ukrainians have not received uh, 9 billion. I think they've been promised 1 billion. You see, uh, oh, incidentally, the, the, the Wall Street Journal published an article on the 13th of June asking whether a large number of these billions have ended up in the pockets of the oligarchs, the bank accounts of the oligarchs. Well, you can be sure of that. Ukraine is probably the most corrupt country on earth. Or maybe the Pakistan comrades and the Nigerian comrades will object that their country is much more corrupt, much <laughs> superior to the Ukrainians. It's only a matter of time before this scandal erupts, by the way. And public opinion is in America is turning sides, not, not very keen on the war anyway. I think only about 30% support uh, Biden's Ukrainian policy. I'm, I'm open to correction. But I, I, saw, I saw a very interesting poll uh, which found the following. Sanctions hurt the U.S. more than Russia. 56%, 442% against. Second one, it's okay, it's okay for the U.S. to let Ukraine, Ukraine lose to Russia. 45% to 40% in favor. And here's a real good one. It would be better to get Biden out of the White House than Putin out of the Kremlin. Approved 56% to 43%. Now, on the question of sanctions... They've been going now for, what, four or five months? It's an economic war against Russia. 
but uh, it's not going to plan. In fact, the Russians are getting more from the sale of oil and gas now than what they were before, partly because of the increase in prices <coughs> and partly from the fact that the, the, the West has not stopped them from selling oil and gas anyway. Let's take one example. Italy in May received about 400,000 barrels of Russian oil a day, every day. That's four times the pre-war pre, pre level. At the same time, Russia has got plenty of, plenty of customers for their oil and gas, oil in particular, for example, to India and China. And by the way, uh, these, these sanctions cut both ways, you know. The West suddenly realized that Russia, Russia, Russia uh, has got a lot of important uh, uh, what, uh, gases, helium and neon, for example, and argon is another one, which are absolutely necessary for the production of electronics. For, the, for example, they, they account for 30% of the, of the uh, consumption of, of world consumption of neon. So that's a problem, isn't it? They, they've had, by the way, I see they just had to do a deal on the week. We, we, we'll see if it lasts, but they had to do that because of the effects. I'll come to that in a moment. I think I've, I think I've, said, I think I've said enough on the question of the Ukrainian war. Some comments ask, how long will it last? Well, I don't know. How long is a piece of string? You can't answer that question seriously. But, uh, but uh, you, you better be sure that the, 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 the Germans in particular have got reasons for wanting this, this war to end quickly. And as, as the crisis deepens, the Ukrainian question, far from being a, a unifying uh, national endeavor, will turn into a divisive political issue, exacerbating all the social and political tensions within and without of the country, and, and outside the country. You see, the, 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 the Americans don't want to be seen publicly of, of, of putting pressure on the Ukrainians, but they are. There's no doubt that, Putin, put, there's no doubt that the Russians will, will, will succeed. It may take a, a few, few weeks or a few months, I don't know. But they will, they will get the whole of, of the Don Bass under their control. At that point, it's quite possible that Putin will, will declare victory and sue for peace on terms favorable to Russia. Now, Kiev has already rejected the idea of a potential peace plan that involves a loss of territory. That's been pushed actively by France and Germany. And Zelensky is complaining about it. Quote, they will say that we have to stop the war that is causing food prob problems and economic problems, he stated. That's just what they will say. I agree with them. In fact, in private, they're saying it already. And in the end, that is what is going to happen, believe me. Now, it's a concrete question. Just look at the facts, the economic facts. The Americans can afford to talk big about boycotting, saying that Europe must boycott Russian oil and gas. Yes, but the Americans have got their own supplies of oil and gas, and Europe does not. And in particular, Germany is heavily dependent on Russian oil and gas in particular. So now the man in the Kremlin is having a good laugh at Germany, watching the, watching the government wriggling like a fish on a hook. They cut off the gas, so ga gas from cut off the gas a little, just as a, as a little warning, you know. Now they started it up again. Yes, at a very low level, 40%. Now ask yourself, put yourself in the shoes of the German bourgeois. What's going to happen in the winter? It's very cold in, in Germany in the winter. What, what would it mean, for example, if the, the, if, if, the, if the Russians suddenly decided to stop the supply of gas? Well, there, there are different estimates, but it would lead at least to a 12.5% drop in, in, the, in the German economy immediately. That's a deep slump. 5.6 million jobs would be affected all across Germany. And some industries like steel and ga glass, which is very important, if, they, if, if these are shut down for any length of time, the installations will be severely damaged and it will take many months to get them back to operative again. Taken together, okay, this would mean a loss of 100 and, 193 billion euros in just six months. And you think the German bourgeoisie doesn't want to deal? Of course they want to deal straight away, as soon as possible. Because the social and political consequences of this will be enormous. And that's what's interesting from our point of view. Olaf Scholz, the German chancellor, put it very, very neatly, I thought. I quote, rising energy prices are endangering security and stability in many countries. Yes, not just Germany. And if you look, if you look at the, the, the economic press, the predictions for the world economy now, they're painting a very black picture. Now, the stock exchange, they do, they do represent something. It represents the, the nervousness of the investors of the bourgeois 
and, and there is turmoil in the markets now. The Americans are raising the interest rates. There's a colossal, a colossal inflation. It's uh, the highest in 40 years, and they can't get it uh, down. In the Eurozone, the situation is the same. I think uh, inflation is more than, more than 8% now. The British economy is heading for a recession by the end of the year, and the other, other, other European economies are even in a worse position. Now, I don't think much of bourgeois economists, as you know, but there's one of them that I happen to like. He's an eccentric man called Nur, Nouriel Roubini. I thought he summed the situation up quite nicely. I'll quote his words if you like. The space for he's comparing this, this crisis with the previous crisis, for example, 2008. The space, the space for fiscal expansion will be more limited this time. Most of the fiscal ammunition has already been used and public debts are becoming unsustainable. What he's saying is you can't continue to spend your way out of a crisis. You've, you've already done that, and the result is vast, uh, unsustainable debts. And this is his conclusion. Things will get much worse before they get better. I mean, the war in Ukraine alone has, has, has sent economic shockwaves, not only in Europe, but in the Middle East, Africa, Asia, Latin America. And for these countries, the perspective is, is a nightmare. Enormous price increases in, 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 in price of, of, of major food crops mean that 44 million people in 38 countries are at emergency, emergency levels of hunger. And the imperialists are, are, are terrified of the, of the consequences. That's why they rush to try and, try and do this deal to try to, re, to release grain from the Ukraine and from Russia. They see the, they see the consequences of this and they see the, the dangers, particularly in the case of Sri Lanka. Which shows, which shows how quickly a revolutionary situation can develop. The economic crisis caused the colossal social and political turmoil in Sri Lanka, which, which expressed itself in a revolutionary situation. And it is astonishing to see the, the speed and the courage with which the mass of people came onto the streets. They forced the, the president, uh, Raja Pasca, to, to flee for, to Singapore. I think he's gone. And then there was a, then, then there was a, a plan a plot, a conspiracy in the parliament to install the prime minister, Ranil Wickremesinghe, as acting, as, as acting president. And this, the news of this provoked an insurrection, an actual insurrection. Wickremesinghe, Wickremesinghe declared a state of emergency. He ordered the army to put down the people. As a result, of the, 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 the masses had attacked his residence, the, the, the prime minister's residence. They were met with a barrage of tear gas and water cannon, but to no avail. Nothing could stop that human tsunami. Comrades, here you can see before your very eyes the colossal potential power of the masses. Power was lying in the street waiting for someone to pick it up. All that was necessary was for the leaders of the protest to, to, to announce, we have the power now, we are the government, and appeal to the soldiers to support them. There's many, many soldiers and officers also did, did support them. But we, these courageous words were never spoken. And here you see the, the importance of revolutionary leadership. The masses in the end quietly left the presidential palace and the old power was allowed to return. The fruits of victory, in other words, were snatched out of the hands of the masses and handed on a tray to the old oppressors and the parliamentary charlatans. That is an un unpalatable truth, but it is the truth. The failure to overthrow the government has allowed Ranil Wickremesinghe to maneuver in parliament to regain the initiative and crack, and crack down on the protest in an attempt to restore order. The Sri, the Sri Lankan revolution deserves a special, uh, special attention. I don't have time to deal with it here. But the upheaval in Sri Lanka is not over, not, not by a long shot. The underlying economic and social problems that provoke the masses into action have not been removed. And therefore the revolution will emerge on an even higher level at a certain stage. Now, Sri Lanka was the first country since the start of the war in Ukraine to default on its debts. It certainly will not be the last. Bloomberg warns that, I, and I quote, a historic cascade of defaults is coming for emerging markets, unquote. More than 19 countries with a population of more than 900 million people have debt levels. That means that default is on the cards. The list of countries includes El Salvador, Ghana, Tunisia, Egypt, Pakistan, Argentina, 
and Ukraine. And the, 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 the combined debt amounts to $237 billion. Now, Pakistan is an extreme case, and I hope that the comments will come into the discussion to speak about Pakistan. Many countries are dependent either on uh, Russian oil or Ukrainian uh, grain and so on. Pakistan is dependent on both. And already the, the, the spike in oil prices has driven up the cost of imports by more than 85%, which is a, cat it's a catastrophic situation. There's a split in the ruling class, open, open split in the ruling class, which brought about the fall of Imran Khan's government, although he's staging a comeback now, I see, in the Punjab. Now, this is a finished recipe for class struggle and even a revolutionary explosion on the lines of 1968-69. The desperate position of the masses is, in, in other words, is, is preparing for a social explosion on the lines of Sri Lanka. Now, what does it mean? What do these things mean? It's not a question of this or that isolated case, not at all. What I'm giving you here is a very accurate picture of what will occur as night follows day in one country after another. And that means it's pregnant with revolutionary possibilities. And that is the most important thing to bear in mind from a Marxist point of view. No country is, is excluded from this uh, perspective, none. The United States is the wealthiest country on earth. And yet, the, the, the level of, of polarization there is extreme. And, and above all, the extreme contrast between we wealth and poverty. I already mentioned, if, I've already mentioned that inflation is approximately 8.6%. That's the highest in 40 years. And there's a powerful undercurrent of discontent. 85% of the people say that the country, the country is on the wrong road, on the wrong track. Biden's attempt to use the Ukraine as a distraction has failed. And the working class is beginning to, to emerge, to awaken, if you like, after a more or less lengthy dormant period. Of course, it will, it will have, to, have to learn many lessons, many ups and downs, many defeats also. I mean, the, 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 the union leadership is so rotten. That's everywhere, not just in the United States, same in Britain, same everywhere. They're rotten. They've forgotten even the elementary things of, of, of that work. You have to organize workers. You have to build the unions. A large number of, of American workers are not even in unions. I think that's particularly in the West and in the South, but that's going to change. That will change into its opposite. A whole generation of young workers in particular are brutally exploited in America. You, you remember what Marx said. Without organization, the working class is just... Uh, raw material for exploitation, that's all. Just look at the, the conditions in, 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 in the call centers or in Amazon, where workers are subjected to, subjected to brutal exploitation, long hours and bad pay. And therefore the movement, the movement to unionize the workers in Amazon and Starbucks is another case, is therefore a huge step forward. There's been a spate, spate of strikes in the States. I think Comrade Tom will probably speak about that. And there's, there's the beginnings of a change in the union, the, the unions. Now, when we come to Europe, you see, Europe is now facing a, a, a deep economic crisis, war in the Ukraine. And in the face of all these problems, the last thing Europe needs is political upheaval and disunity. But that's the picture we see everywhere. We saw it previously in Greece, which we said was the weaker, weakest link in the chain of European capitalism. The crisis in Greece has not been solved, of course. But that honor, that honor of being the weakest link in the chain is now reserved for Italy, where the public debt, if I'm not mistaken, is almost 150% of the gross domestic product. That's unsustainable, of course. But in order to reduce it, deep cuts in public spending will be necessary. And the Italian bourgeois needs a strong government to carry through an attack on the working class. But a stable coalition government is impossible to achieve in Italy. We saw the, down, the recent downfall of Draghi it's a further confirmation of political instability. By the way, the Greece's public debt, I think it's now 186% of GDP. That's the exact the same situation as, as before, except that the ECB, the European Commission, or Central Bank rather, can no longer print money to, to escape from it. In the situation of galloping inflation, that's impossible. Yes, but Italy is not Greece. The crisis in Italy poses a, a, a deadly threat to one of the Eurozone's biggest economies. Now, we, let, we see a similar process in France, where they thought that Macron would represent a revival of the center, 
the, the feds have now dealt him a blood, given him a bloody nose, taking away his majority in the legislative elections. He wanted, he called on voters to deliver a solid majority, but his centrist coalition suffered a total rout in an election that's left French politics sharply polarized. Now, Marx said that, that France was the country where the class struggle was always fought to the finish. The Macron government is clearly a weak government. It will be faced with enormous pressure from both the left and the right. It will be a government of crisis from the very beginning. And, th and therefore, the stage is set for an explosion of the class struggle in France, where the workers have got a strong tradition of, of taking to the streets. Some people talk about a revival of the Gilets Jean movement. But such is the colossal anger that is building up and the hatred of Macron that I believe that a new edition of the general strike of, of 1968 is entirely possible. And like in 1968, it can happen without any warning. And our French comedy must be prepared for that. Again, if you looked at Britain, not long ago, that was considered to be the most, one of the most stable countries in Europe. Now it's probably the most unstable. The situation has become increasingly convulsive, politically, economically, and socially. For example, the level of strikes in Britain was historically low. Now there's a change. We've had the first national rail strike for 30 years, and a whole number of low, a whole number of low public sector workers are threatening to follow their example. There's a whole list I won't do to deal with. That. Well, I might as well give the list. Bus workers, refuse workers, airport workers, construction workers, Postal workers, civil servants, teachers, lecturers, and even barristers, you know, lawyers with their, with their wigs, you know, with, their, with these 18th century wigs, have been demonstrating on the streets. Now, this poses a serious threat to the ruling class. And here's a quote from, the, again, from the Financial Times, 18th of June. Bear in mind, bear in mind that they've got a severe government crisis. Boris Johnson's just been ejected. The trouble is that the woman that will take his place is an even bigger lunatic than him. One cabinet minister said that the government was walking a delicate tightrope of keeping pay down and avoiding an inflationary wage spiral without forcing multiple sectors on strike. Quote, this is a minister, if we get this wrong, the risk of getting into a de facto general strike will create further turmoil that risks grinding the whole economy to a halt. Now, this is the language of class war, and it shows that the enormous possibilities will open up for the work of the British Marxist tendency. In Germany also, I see that there's a perspective of a recovery of uh, strikes on the industrial front. And the main, the, the main feature in, the, in, in all this situation is polarization, a sharp polarization between the left and right, a collapse of the political center everywhere. I, I, again, I don't have time to deal with events in Latin America, which are very important. Not just Ecuador, which I've mentioned, but also the elections in, in Colombia. By the way, I, I debated with this man, uh, Gustavo Petro, in, it was in Caracas some years ago, and it can confirm my suspicion that the worst reformists are the former guerrillas. In other words, I'm, I'm afraid that the Colombian workers will have to pass through the experience of, uh, of, uh, of, of a petrol government, and it will be a very harsh school. But in the, in the, in the few minutes left to me, we, we, we should begin to draw the threads together. What the, the, pic, the picture that emerges is on the one, one hand, a deep crisis of capitalism, and the opening up of, 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 of potential for massive class struggles in one country after another. We already see the existence of an enormous ferment in other words, the objective conditions are not just ripe for socialist revolution, but rotten ripe. But there's a problem, isn't there? There's a problem. As you see in Sri Lanka yet again, the objective conditions are ripe for revolution, yes. But the essential factor is missing. The subjective factor does not correspond to the objective conditions at all. That is what explains the delay in the socialist revolution, nothing else. And of course, the total bankruptcy of the so-called left, everywhere is the same. The, the left reformists have long ago abandoned any idea of changing society. They made their peace with the capitalist system. They, but they want a nice capitalist system, you see, a, a humane capitalism with a human face, they say. For some reason, they, these gentlemen regard themselves as great realists. I don't know why. This is the realism of a man who wishes to persuade a tiger to eat the salads instead of flesh. 
In other words, they're, they're the worst kind, worst kind of reactionary utopians. But they'll be exposed by events, one after the other, and the, therefore the crisis of capitalism also signifies the crisis of reformism. All their perspectives will be shown to be false in practice, in experience. By contrast, the perspectives of the Marxists will be shown to be correct. Commerce, that is our main strength, not numbers or money or a powerful apparatus, but the power of ideas. And that's something that the stupid reformists will never understand. In 1938, Leon Trotsky said that the world crisis can be reduced to one thing. That's the crisis of the leadership of the working class. And that is absolutely the case today. We see again in, in Sri Lanka, and it's a real tragedy how the lack of leadership has robbed the masses, at least in the short run, has, has robbed them of victory. And the same tragedy will be repeated time and time again until the working class is armed with the only program that can guarantee its success. The working class will only ever triumph when it is armed with a revolutionary socialist program. This program is defended by the international Marxist tendency. We have defended under the most difficult conditions the banner of proletarian internationalism, the authentic ideas of Marx, Engels, Lenin, and Trotsky. We have the best ideas, but that is not enough, Comrades. That's not enough. We have to work hard so that these ideas become transformed into militant members, so that quality becomes quantity, and quantity in, in turn becomes quality. The, the conditions are being uh, assured for, for a revolutionary developments everywhere. That's, that's for certain. But you know, comrades, it's not enough. It's not the same to enter into a new situation like that with an organization of 50 to enter it with an organization of 500 or 1,000 or 10,000. And therefore, we must concentrate all our energies on, on the main objective, which is the building of the revolutionary international in the shortest time possible. Build the IMT. Comrades, that is the challenge before us. And it, it, it is a race against time. Events can, can catch up with us when we're not expecting it. And therefore, nothing must be allowed to stand in our way. Comrades, build the IMT. Long live the socialist revolution. Workers of the world unite. Thank you very much for that excellent speech, Alan. We will now go on to the discussion with comrades from all over the world coming to, to report on the conditions in their countries. And we'll start from the right from the belly of the beast, the heart of US imperialism, with comrade Tom Trotchier from Socialist Revolution, the, um, the, the, the US section of the IMT. A Marxist greetings from New York. It was an excellent lead off by Alan. As Alan explained, the crisis of world capitalism and American capitalism has intensified the class struggle everywhere. The Ukraine war and its effect on world trade has also added fuel to the fire. Beginning at the end of the George W. Bush administration, through Obama and Trump administrations, and including the first years of Biden, the US government has been pumping money into the economy with deficit spending, and the US Federal Reserve has monetized the debt, which means printing money, to prop up sick American capitalism. We predicted this would lead to inflation, but extreme weakness of the private sector postponed this development. But now the economy is feeling this, plus the disruption of the supply chain due to war, COVID, sanctions, increase in protectionism. The latest inflation rate uh, reported in, in the United States is over 9%. In order to counteract that, the Federal Reserve is now raising interest rates and selling some of its assets to counter the inflation, but they're trying not to cause a slump at the same time. A bourgeois economist described the Federal Reserve as trying to land an airplane safely during an earthquake. Uh, there's already a drop in home sales. In May, home sales were down 3.4%. There's also been an increase in housing costs they estimate of $600 a month just due to increase in interest rates. And as less people can afford to purchase a home, that's driving rents up uh, by phenomenal numbers. All of this has sent Biden's poll numbers down. His approval rating is below four out of 10 Americans. 
Ellen explained that 85% of Americans think the country is on the wrong track. Also, 79% believe that the economy could be described as poor. If you look at 18 to 29 year olds, Biden's approval rating, strongly people who strongly approve Biden, it's only 1%. Among those less than 30, 26% don't support either the Democrats or the Republicans in the upcoming November midterm election. An even more um, uh, uh, interesting number, 58% of Americans say that the world's oldest independent constitutional democracy needs major reforms or complete overall. The, the trust in institutions throughout society is going down. Even the military, only 45% of the Americans have trust or confidence in the military. Biden was hoping that the uh, US imperialism's tough stand on the Ukraine would distract people from his domestic failures, but this has not happened. Many in the ruling class don't want Biden to run again, but they don't have any strong people to take his place. It's very possible Trump could run again, and it's possible he could win. The crisis in the United States is a crisis of the regime as a whole. Ruling class institutions that helped maintain stability in the past have turned into their opposite. They now create instability. Take, take a look at the U.S. Supreme Court and its recent ruling on abortion as an example. Instead of calming things down, they poured gasoline on the fire. In 1973, the Supreme Court legalized abortion as a way to cut across an abortion rights movement and a woman's rights movement. Now, instead of cutting across a movement, they're, they're actually creating a big movement. Abortion is now illegal or will soon be illegal in 16 states, and, and, and uh, there'll be tough restrictions in another eight states, which is almost half the country. The, the Supreme Court's ruling on this and, and other issues like election issues, it's going to continue actually to undermine illusions in bourgeois democracy and increase questioning of the legitimacy of the US federal and state government. The pressure is building up. This is adding, uh, um, um, adding fuel to the class struggle in the United States. Back in 1953, about 36% of the private sector workers in the United States were in a union. By 1995, it was down to 10.4%, and now it's 6.9%. There were record low numbers of strikes from 1990 till about 2018. But after three decades, the labor movement is beginning to revive in the United States. There's approximately 200 Starbucks coffee stores have voted for union representation. And there's another 200 stores that have petitioned for a union vote or the result is pending. There's an effort being made by Apple workers in Apple stores to unionize, starting with a store in Atlanta and another store in Maryland. And of course, we, we saw the, the uh, victory of the Amazon labor union in being able to organize that huge Amazon warehouse in Staten Island, New York. This, this comes on top of a whole wave of strikes that we saw last year, particularly in October of last year, and a growth of oppositions in the Teamsters Union, in the Carpenters Union, and the United Auto Workers Union. There are new layers coming forward in the labor struggle, but they will face many obstacles. As they try to figure out a way around these obstacles, there will develop more radical wings of the labor movement, and there will be many opportunities for Marxism. There is tremendous potential for the working class in the United States but the ability of labor to use its power to bring about change is weakened by its leadership. The labor leadership accepts the capitalist system and all of its limitations, but the American working class will regain its traditions from the 1930s, plant occupations, sit-down strikes, and other militant action. And this is why we must build up the Marxist tendency. We will do this by studying theory and connecting our, our ideas with the growing struggles against the capitalist system. The American working class with a Marxist leadership can put an end to American capitalism and thereby free the world from its present chains. Thank you very much, uh, Tom, for that excellent contribution. The next speaker is a comrade from the Marxist tendency in Russia. Comrades, it is uh, pleasing for me to see you all uh, through the borders of the war that we have today. And uh, I think it's a good example of what proletarian internationalism is. 
Amit had described the, you know, Tom speaking from the belly of the beast. Well, today I'm speaking from the belly of another beast, the Russian imperialism. Today we are facing that the post-Soviet space and the whole world ended into the fourth and the next and it will enter into the fifth month of an active phase of a military conflict. Those gave their first, first bloody shots in 2014 and now blossomed with the bloody flames of an armed invasion of the Russian army into the territory of Ukraine in March of this year. And comrades already said uh, how big the repercussions of this conflict. Uh, we're talking here about an inter-imperialist contradiction, the struggle for the redistribution of the markets, the struggle for national libera liberation, and the desperate attempts of the workers and the communist movement to find a point for their revival in their Eastern Europe. And all of those are inter intervined into a complex tangle. The, what we see cannot be reduced to only one of the listed aspects, since all of, since all of them taken all together is that they form that monstrous mixture that we are witnessing. And I can only repeat what was said, I think, at least in the last four or five years, that the events of the last two de decades around the world have truly put into the, to shame the cheap prophecies of Francis Fukuyama about the end of the history. Comrades, history continues and being created before our eyes in the most direct way, and the war in Ukraine is both evidence and part of this process. And since I'm talking about uh, Russia, let me touch upon the question of uh, the war, the uh, Russian authorities uh, and its actions within the framework of this war internally and externally and the uh, reaction to it from the part of the Russian society and from the part of the Russian left. Obviously, the Russian regime, uh, although it may seem pretty stern uh, on, the, on the in appearance, but in fact, it's in a deep and prolonged crisis that it experienced over the last years. The protests against the pension reform and uh, the, uh, the uh, liberal uh, Naval uh, Navalny protest movement were just the first sparks uh, that indicated this crisis. And uh, in trying to answer all these challenges that it faces, the regime uh, tries to use uh, two old methods uh, that uh, are being used all over the world by any authoritarian regimes that were out there. And we are talking about a complex crisis that includes politics, so social issues, and economics. On the one hand, it uh, uh, you know cuts on the social spending, attacks the rights of the workers, attacks the living conditions of the workers, and narrows the political spa space for free expression within the country. And on the other, it tries to win over the support and or at least loyalty from uh, the major part of the population with the old known trick called uh, Little Victorious War. But uh, as we all know, sometimes uh, the ideas for Little Victorious War can turn into the opposite as uh, the Russian Revolution of 1905 teaches us. Uh, today we see that uh, under the pretext of the war, uh, the Russian regime inflames the chauvinistic propaganda. It uh, goes down and uh, crashes down on any kind of an opposition. First, it tries to fully eliminate the liberals and no doubts that the, the next aim will be the left. And it creates, uh, on the one hand, a pretty hard conditions uh, for us to work at the moment. But I think we must uh, sustain a good a revolutionary optimism because of what the consequences of these policies will be. Because the harder you push, the harder will be the backfire of your actions. And uh, we need to say that what uh, awaits for the Russian regime. But do we have an immediate revolutionary perspective just now? Of course, we have it in the prolonged term, but we don't have it just at the moment. Uh, we need to say that uh, a big uh, part of the Russian working class at least accepted what regime done. And it comes uh, on the one hand from the fear of even worse, co worse consequences. And on the other hand, uh, or it based on the memories of the 90s and the uh, uh, implicit, uh, implicit uh, hatred among the uh, uh, big layers of the Russian working class towards the NATO. But I, I can assure you comrades, as the, the, uh, as the situation will be developing, uh, the Russian working class will awake and step over the uh, poisonous idea that it must accept the 
uh, awful regime that we have in order just to not to uh, to face the worst con worst consequences because the, those are already coming russian governmental official officials were constantly talking about you know we we do not fear sanctions uh, we can economically overcome it and uh, use you know replace all the imports uh, imports uh, and replace them with the uh, homegrown productions but in fact that's not what's happening we can see that in general the uh, gross uh, industrial production in Russia had gone seven times less than uh, in the whole Putin's period in comparison to the year 2000. Uh, it is uh, the uh, problems with replacing the exports is exports is imp uh, imports is especially is especially seen in the automobile industry, uh, where, for example, on uh, one of the biggest uh, national automobile factories, Autovaz. In order to keep production going, they had to abandon uh, putting, you know, safety bags in, into into uh, the cars that they produce and many other elements that uh, they were dependent on uh, with the imports. And that's just one example. In general, I can go into the details because I have very little time. But the repercussions of the war uh, uh, strike economically into into all the Russian society and especially on the working class. And I can assure you, at, at some point, the working class of Russia will awake. Already by the beginning of the war, if we take the charts, about 50% of the poorest population were against the war. And although uh, the first wave of mass protests uh, uh, gone down, uh, gone down the weathered way uh, by the April, but the anger will be brew uh, brewing. But it poses for us a question. Where today in Russia, or Ukraine or in Europe, that mass uh, pa workers' party that uh, has a clear revolutionary perspective and clearly stands against its own government. There is none. The Communist Party of the Russian Federation, its leadership absolutely capitulated to the social chauvinism. Some of the Stalinist sects uh, done uh, this also. Others, uh, other sects on the left uh, gone into unthinking support for the Western imperialism. And uh, Today, the uh, Russian section of the IMT is the only one organization that gave a clear class proletarian line that stands against the Russian government and all the imperialistic forces, regardless of the side. And that's also the compliment that I can give to our Ukrainian comrades who had not uh, succumbed to, to the pressure of the petty, petty bourgeois social chauvinism. But in order to break the situation, in order to turn it, what we need to do is to build and build and build a genuine revolutionary party in Russia, in Ukraine, and all over post-Soviet uh, space to turn the imperialist war into a class war, to achieve the goals of the socialist revolution, and to unite our attempts, our struggle with our sisters and brothers all over the world in order to achieve the world commune and the world socialist revolution. Long live the IMT, long live the proletarian revolution. Thank you very much, uh, the comrade from Russia. Uh, the next speaker will be uh, comrade Jérôme Metellus from Revolution, the French section of the IMT. The process of political polarization that Alan described and the massive rejection of the bourgeois political system have been graphically expressed in the recent elections in France. That is the presidential election in April and the parliamentary elections in June. In the first round of the presidential election, compared to 2017, there was a big increase in votes for the far right and for the so-called radical left, that is in reality for the left reformists. In fact, without the, the divisive role of the Communist Party and the ultra-left organizations in the first round, Mélenchon would have qualified for the second round. In any case, the right-wing reformists were humiliated. The Socialist Party candidate, who, who is the mayor of Paris, uh, she's got less than 2%. And uh, the Greens, uh, they got less than 5%. Uh, another expression of the political polarization was the attitude of millions of young people between the two rounds of the, of the election. A lot of them rejected completely the so-called Republican Front, 
that is the call to vote for Macron in order to defeat, de defeat Le Pen in the second round. As a matter of fact, for the last five years, Macron, Macron's government has adopted all the racist and anti-Muslim demagogy of Marine Le Pen. And the Yellow Vest movement was confronted with the most brutal police repression since the war of independence in Algeria 60 years ago. So among the youth and the most exploited sections of the working class, a lot of people are, are, were wondering, what is the real difference between Macron and Le Pen? And the, and the only difference they could see is that Macron is in power while, while Le Pen is not. And that's indeed the main difference from a class point of view. The results of the parliamentary elections in June, in June were also very significant, very interesting. The most important figure which all the politicians tried to ignore, including the left reformists, was the abstention rate, nearly 53% in the first round and 54% in the second round. But if you add the blank and invalid votes, it was close to 60%. So it shows clearly a, a, re a rejection of the entire bourgeois political system by a large majority of the youth and the workers. As for Macron, he lost its absolute majority in the parliament and the national rally, Le Pen's party, came out as, as the real main winner of this election with 89 seats against seven seats uh, last time in, in 2017. As for the left parties, they united in the first round of the parliamentary election in order to secure a significant, significant number of seats and, and they succeeded in, in doing so. But the, this very same unity between the left and the right reformists could not and did not generate a lot of enthusiasm. And they didn't increase the number of votes uh, between 2017 and 2022. In fact, in fact they lost, uh, I think, 1 million votes or a lot of votes. And therefore, in the parliamentary election, the polarization mainly it expressed itself on the right. To sum, it, to sum up on, on these elections, uh, what we have is a government of crisis from day one. And this in the context of an economic crisis and rising inflation, which provokes already a, a, a rising uh, a, a number of uh, strikes. Strike, of, of course, for higher wages. And Macron is well aware of his precarious position. And I'm sure he remembers that only 18 months after his first election in 2017, the Yellow Vest movement erupted. Without the treacherous role of the trade union leaders who rejected the Yellow Vest movement or at least distanced, distanced themselves from it, this movement could have easily overthrown the government and Macron himself. But uh, today the situation is even worse than in 2017. So, now, this summer, Macron is announcing a whole, whole series of petty measures to support the purchasing power of the mass of the population, without taking a penny from the capitalists, of course, which means that Macron will take back with the right hand 10, 10 times more than what he gives now from his left hand. In fact, he will have no choice but to attack brutally the youth and the working class, because French capitali capitalism has been declining for decades and the ruling class is calling for what it calls a competitive shock. Uh, a new labor law is on the agenda, together with a new pension reform, because the previous one was interrupted by COVID, and also a massive reduction in the number of civil servants. Now, only the blinds and the cynics can imagine that such a program could be applied without provoking big movement of the workers and, and, and the youth in France. In fact, the situation is more explosive, explosive than ever, certainly more explosive than in 2017. And a new May 68 could erupt at any time, as, as Alan explained. The youth in particular will, will mobilize one way or another, because the youth has been brutally attacked by the previous government, especially the student youth, who was completely left to itself during the peaks of the COVID crisis, you had, you had long queues of thousands of students queuing for, for free food and charity associations. 
Uh, and, and the youth was accused, of course, of being responsible of the propagation of the virus, virus. So this new generation is getting more and more radicalized by the crisis of capitalism in general, all its features. And it is uh, uh, above all among the most radicalized layers of this youth that we are building and we'll be building the French section of the IMT. Thank you very, very much, Jerome. Uh, the next speaker will be Comrade Serge Goulart from Esquerda Marxista, which is the Brazilian section of the IMT. Serge will speak in Spanish, but uh, he will be translated into English within this stream. Greetings, a los camaradas de todo el mundo. Greetings to uh, comrades all over the world who are following this event. Y resalto que cuando hablo izquierda marxista estoy hablando de la sesión brasileña de la corriente marxista internacional. I'd like to underscore that when I say izquierda marxista, I am referring to uh, the uh, to the Brazilian section of the uh, uh, IMT. La situación de Brasil es la expresión de la situación mundial. The situation in Brazil is an expression of the world situation. Época de guerras y revoluciones. This is an epoch of wars and revolutions. Hemos llegado a un momento de impasse de la sociedad capitalista, un sistema social que se devora a sí mismo y sumerge al mundo en el camino de la barbarie. Capitalism has reached uh, an impasse. This is a society that has reached uh, a complete uh, deadlock and is uh, slipping into, uh, into total decomposition. Pero hay otro camino, el camino de la lucha de clase, de la revolución proletaria y del socialismo. But there is another road, the road of uh, class struggle and the socialist proletarian revolution. Del fin del régimen de la propiedad privada de los grandes medios de producción. Of the end of uh, the regime of private property over the large means of production. La situación actual es de crisis de todos los regímenes burgueses y de intensa polarización social. The current situation is one of deep crisis for bourgeois regimes and of deep social polarization. Y cómo resisten y luchan las masas. And of how the masses resist and struggle. Y en el mundo estallan insurrecciones y revoluciones. Pero hasta que construyamos los partidos obreros revolucionarios, que dirijan estas insurrecciones y revoluciones. Uh, all over the world, there are uh, revolutions and insurrections uh, breaking out. But in we, until we build uh, the revolutionary work as a part that can lead these insurrections and revolutions. O todo siempre terminará como la espuma sobre las olas del mar. Everything will uh, end like the waves, uh, like the waves uh, dying out on the on the beach. Pero solo para que todo empiece otra vez, como las olas del mar. Uh, but this is only for uh, the movement to start all over again from the beginning, like the, like the waves uh, breaking on the beach. En Brasil esto es lo que se está preparando. Para comprender lo que pasa en Brasil hay que volver un poco. This is what uh, is in the making in uh, Brazil. In order to understand the current situation in this country, we have to turn uh, our, our rise back, uh, further back into the past. In 2018, when Bolsonaro won the elections because the governments of Lula and Dilma betrayed the hopes of the people. In 2018, when Bolsonaro won the elections because the governments of Lula and Dilma had betrayed all of the expectations that, the, that they had awakened among the, among the people. All the organizations reformistas PT, PC, All... Partido Comunista de Brasil y otras, y casi toda la izquierda que se reclama de la revolución y del socialismo, anunciaron la llegada del fascismo. When this happened, when Bolsonaro came uh, to power, all of the reformist uh, organizations, uh, the, the Workers' Party, the Communist Party, the PSOL, uh, and all of the so-called revolutionary and socialist uh, left, announced that uh, fascism had taken over. Era, por supuesto, una falsa línea política que mezclaba impresionismo, pánico, cobardía. This, of course, was a mistaken political line that uh, was a, a mix of impressionism, panic, cowardice, uh, and mm. uh, a complete lack of any serious attempt to uh, analyze the situation. Ningunos intentos serios de analizar a fondo la situación. 
pero también un intento de poner a todos en la línea de defensa de la democracia burguesa. But uh, this also reflected their efforts uh, to um, put the entire left at the service of bourgeois democracy, uh, to defend bourgeois democracy. La izquierda marxista, tras la victoria de Bolsonaro, explicó que no se trataba de un gobierno fascista, fascista, sino de un intento de un gobierno bonapartista. The Marxist left explained that this was not a fascist uh, regime that had taken over, but rather an attempt to establish a bonapartist uh, regime. Pero mismo, mismo este intento estaba condenado al fracaso. But uh, even this attempt was uh, doomed to failure. Bolsonaro ha demostrado que es incapaz de desarrollar un movimiento o organización fascista con base de masa. Bolsonaro has proven uh, incapable of building uh, a, a mass fascist movement. Así como es incapaz de destruir las organizaciones obreras o partidos de izquierda. Uh, um, equally, he is incapable of crushing uh, the workers and leftist parties and uh, organizations. Cuando la izquierda marxista, tres meses después de la llegada de Bolsonaro a la presidencia, presentó públicamente la consigna de fuera Bolsonaro, fue Three combatido months. por todas las organizaciones de izquierda. Three months uh, into Bolsonaro's government, when uh, the Marxist left came out with the slogan down with uh, Bolsonaro, we were, uh, we were criticized by the entire left. Que gritaban fascismo, fascismo. They were simply uh, shouting, this is fascism, this is fascism. En los primeros meses de gobierno, apoyadores de Bolsonaro intentaron atacar asambleas sindicales y manifestaciones estudiantiles. In the first months of Bolsonaro's government, his followers tried to, um, tried to uh, scatter uh, trade union assemblies uh, and some uh, student protests. Pero fueron rechazados y expulsados y jamás regresaron. But they were fought back and repelled, and they never came back. Bolsonaro's followers never came back. In determinado momento, el PC, PC, Partido Comunista do Brasil, PSOL, PDT, PSB, han publicado una declaración nacional condenando la consigna de fuera Bolsonaro y defendiendo el derecho de Bolsonaro a gobernar. At a given point, uh, the different reformist uh, parties, the, the Workers' Party, the Communist Party, the PDT, the PSB, they issued a joint uh, statement saying that the slogan done with Bolsonaro was mistaken and Bolsonaro had the right to rule for his entire term. When Lula salió de la prisión, nos llamó de locos que enarbolaban la consigna de fuera Bolsonaro y llamó a respetar el mandato. When Lula came out of prison, he also uh, He also said that the slogan done with Bolsonaro was uh, crazy and that we had to respect uh, his term in office. Pero las masas agarraron esta consigna e ignoraron los dirigentes políticos y sindicales. But the masses went their own way. They picked up on this uh, slogan, ignoring their trade union and uh, left-wing leaders. Entonces tuvieron que agarrar la consigna y convertirla en Lula Presidente 2022. It was then that the reformist parties had to accept uh, this, slogan, this slogan, although they uh, gave it a twist and turned it into the call for uh, a, a Lula victory in the 20, uh, 2022 elections. Para evitar una situación revolucionaria en Brasil. They did this in order to uh, avoid a revolutionary situation in Brasil. Five Cancelaron minutes ago. todas las manifestaciones es sacar a las masas de las calles. In order to end the, the demonstrations and uh, take the masses away from the street. Bolsonaro tiene su modelo Trump y lo que pasó en el Capitolio, pero no tiene esta capacidad y por esto dice para todo el tiempo que será robado en las elecciones. Bolsonaro's uh, role model is uh, Trump and he, he uh, is trying to imitate him uh, during the, cap the capital events, but he doesn't really have the capacity to, uh, to uh, launch such a movement. So he is now simply whimpering that the elections are going to be stolen away from him.
pero las masas utilizarán lo que está en sus manos para derrotar Bolsonaro y en este momento votarán Lula, que debe ganar la presidencia. But the masses will use whatever is at hand in order to uh, get rid of Bolsonaro, and that means uh, that they will now vote uh, for Lula to, to kick him out in the elections. Y Lula prepara en alianza con los burgueses un gobierno de unidad nacional. On his part, Lula is preparing hand in hand with the bourgeoisie a government of national unity. Pero todo el desarrollo de la situación económica, social, política prepara un choque y un estallido revolucionario en Brasil. But the entire social uh, and economic situation is preparing the ground for uh, a mass, for mass social upheaval in Brazil. Nuestra línea política es abajo Bolsonaro, abajo el capitalismo, por un gobierno obrero sin patrones ni generales, por el socialismo internacional. Our slogan is down with uh, Bolsonaro, down with uh, capitalism, for a government with no uh, bosses or uh, generals for uh, socialism. Planteando un programa revolucionario, la izquierda marxista le da un apoyo crítico a Lula sin dejar de hacer todas las críticas que se deben hacer por su alianza y por sus actitudes, por su programa. On this line, uh, and emphasizing our revolutionary program, we uh, call for critical uh, support for Lula in these uh, elections, but without uh, watering down our criticisms uh, in, in any way against uh, Lula uh, and against his uh, national unity front. Y en esta situación también organiza la izquierda marxista la conmemoración de 20 años de ocupación de fábricas en Brasil que estuvieran a cargo de militantes de la izquierda marxista. In this uh, context, in this uh, social and political context, the Marxist left is also organizing the 20-year uh, the commemoration of the uh, factory occupations in Brazil that were uh, organized and, and led by the Marxist left. Las ocupaciones de fábrica fueron aplastadas por una coalición de los principales sindicatos de empresarios de Brasil, del gobierno de Lula y el poder judicial que tomaran la fábrica a punta de pistola. The factory occupations were, uh, were derailed and crushed by an alliance of the employers' uh, federation, the judiciary, and Lula's uh, police that uh, took the factories uh, at uh, gunpoint. Pero esta, esta bandera sigue en las manos solamente de izquierda marxista en Brasil, y nos enorgullamos del batalla, de la batalla que demos. Y por esto vamos a conmemorar los 20 años de agosto a octubre. But the banner of the factory uh, occupations uh, belong to, uh, to, belongs to us, and we uh, take pride in this uh, legacy, and this is why in October we will have... Uh, El futuro de la humanidad es la toma de las fábricas. Es la toma del poder por la clase obrera y la reorganización de la sociedad de forma colectiva y democráticamente planificada. Because the future of humanity lies precisely in the uh, conquest, the takeover of the factories, the conquest of power by the working class and the reorganization uh, collectively and democratically uh, on the basis of a planned economy, planned by the majority of the population. Invitamos a todos a acompañar estas celebraciones en nuestras páginas web porque están ahí preciosas lecciones. We call on all uh, comrades to follow this, uh, this uh, commemorations and to, uh, draw, and to study the lessons of the factory occupation movement. Viva la lucha obrera internacional. Viva el socialismo internacional. Trabajadores del mundo, unidos, únanse. Long live uh, the international working class, long live international socialism, workers of the world unite. Thank you very much, Comrade Serge. That was excellent. The next speaker will be Comrade Jorge Martin from the International Secretariat of the INT. Yes, comrades, the, the war in Ukraine has been going on for five months now, and they say that the first casualty of war is truth. If you, if you were to believe Western propaganda, Russia has been completely defeated on the battlefront for at least three months, 
The Ukrainian forces are about to wage a massive offensive on all fronts. And in a couple of weeks, they'll be taking over Moscow. Ah, and don't forget, Putin is so ill, he's about to die. And if he doesn't die, he will be immediately deposed by his generals tomorrow. But of course, this is all uh, propaganda. And if we want to understand, we need to cut through the fog of propaganda in the mass media. We, ne we need to start from basic points. At bottom, this is a conflict between Russia, a regional imperialist power, and the United States, which is the world's largest and most powerful and reactionary imperialist power. And this conflict is being conducted on Ukrainian soil, soil with horrible consequences for Ukrainian civilians, for the Ukrainian soldiers who are being used as cannon fodder, and for Ukrainian infrastructure, which is being destroyed. US imperialism and, and its allies in uh, NATO and other countries, they supply Ukraine with ammunition, artillery pieces, missiles, intelligence, satellite images, and there is regular coordination, as they have admitted, and advice to the general staff of the Ukrainian army on the part of the top command of the Western uh, armies. The West is training and instructing Ukrainian uh, soldiers in different countries. The West pays the budget of the Ukrainian uh, government, and all of this, of course, is done in the name of national sovereignty, in inverted commas. Let's, let's be clear. We oppose the Russian invasion of Ukraine because it is reactionary and imperialist and can only have negative consequences for both the Russian and the Ukrainian working class. But as Alan has explained in his little, uh, the, the task of dealing with Putin is the task of the Russian workers. Our main enemy in the West is our own imperialist uh, class. In reality, war is a very complicated equation, the solution of which depends on the relative strength of many different factors, some of which are technical military factors, uh, like the strength of different types of weaponry, air cover, air defense, intelligence, logistics, but also many other factors which are political, including uh, the morale of the troops, the quality of the political uh, leadership, the development of public opinion, from a military point of view, it's clear that Russia is winning the current phase of the war. After failing to force the capitulation of Zelensky by surrounding Kiev and all the main cities at the beginning, the Russians changed tactics and concentrated on, ta concentrated on taking over the Donbass. And in this phase of the conflict, using their superiority in uh, artillery, they have advanced slowly but uh, relentlessly. The Ukrainian army is sustaining heavy losses of personnel and uh, is, is having to replace trained, experienced troops with territorial defense units. The Russians have now taken over the administrative borders of the Luhansk uh, region and after an operational pause, which is taking place now, will advance on the administrative borders of the Donetsk uh, region. Meanwhile, they still have control of Kherson, large parts of the Zaporizhia region, and also a part of, uh, of the Kharkov region, which they need for, supply, for supplying their troops on the front. Their immediate aim is to take over these four regions and incorporate them into the Russian Federation. In the last few weeks, the Ukrainians have been supplied with HIMARS, the high mobility artillery rocket systems, but so far, only a very small number of them are on the, on the front. These rocket systems allow Ukraine to hit the Russian uh, rear uh, ammunition depots, bridges, and, and other logistics. But the Russians have quickly adapted to these uh, new uh, artillery uh, pieces in the hands of the Ukrainians. And it's very unlikely that this will decisively change the course of the war. And now there are a number of political factors which are starting to play a bigger role. Because of the, of the, um, of the defeats or the reverses uh, on the front, there is now a big political crisis in Ukraine. Zelensky has dismissed the head of the, of the security service and the state prosecutor. 
the Ukrainian uh, news outlets are full of a discussion about which measures are acceptable in order to force military age men to uh, turn up for, for the army. Uh, Alan has already explained that the sanctions on Russia have not forced uh, Putin to change course, but they have seriously backfired on Europe, particularly on Germany, which is facing a major crisis on, on this question. And now, ironically, they complain. The European Union imposed sanctions on Russia for political uh, reasons, and now they complain. Oh, Putin is using the gas to blackmail Europe. And of course, he is doing that. Uh, and the cost of living crisis in Europe, which is severely aggravated by this question of uh, sanctions and the war in Ukraine, is putting enormous pressure on the capitalist class in Germany, France, Italy, pressure towards achieving some sort of deal, which will allow them to lift the sanctions, at least partially, and save their economies. And there are two, or two recent examples of this. The grain deal that was signed yesterday, the deal in relation to the Siemens turbine, which was being repaired in Canada for Gazprom, the Russian uh, gas company, and, uh, and the less, uh, less known uh, deal over titanium, which has been excluded from EU sanctions at the request of Airbus. Airbus. When talking about this uh, Siemens turbine, the German foreign minister said, if we don't get any more gas, we won't be able to support Ukraine because we will be dealing with popular uprisings. In summary, in summary, the war in Ukraine has pushed Russia to a closer alliance with China, and it has brought to the surface the, the divisions between Washington and its allies in the European Union. It has been used to ramp up military spending. It has accelerated the developing world recession with very serious political and social consequences. What we need to explain is that the only way to put an end to the horrors of war is the struggle for socialism, because there can only be peace once we abolish the imperialist capitalist system. Uh, the next speaker will be Comrade Aftab Ashraf from the Pakistani section of the IMT, Lal Salam. Uh, comrade, uh, uh, the state of Pakistan uh, is uh, passing through uh, the most severest crisis in its 75 years of existence. Uh, the country is literally on the verge of uh, uh, default. Um, there is a 22-23% inflation rate in the country according to the government estimates, but according to our estimates, uh, the inflation rate in Pakistan is around about 30% uh, at least. The currency is nose diving and the Pakistani rupee is hemorrhaging value on a daily basis. And the government ministers are, the finance minister and the government uh, bureaucrats are running uh, from pillar to post uh, for securing uh, the IMF loan. And despite having a staff level agreement uh, uh, with the IMF, uh, the uh, revival of the loan program uh, is still uh, getting delayed. And uh, because of that, there is extreme turmoil in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the country's financial markets, and there is uh, panic in the stock exchange, et cetera, et cetera. A simple measure of the gravity of the situation can be uh, uh, this, that uh, during the current fiscal year, uh, starting from 1st of July to the next year, uh, 30th of June, during this fiscal year, Pakistan needs uh, 37 billion US dollars uh, to uh, finance its external sector, but the state bank, the central bank of Pakistan has only 9.7 billion US dollars with it. Uh, recently, the State Bank of Pakistan has raised the benchmark interest rate to 15%. That is one of the highest in all of uh, the world uh, in a desperate attempt to control infl inflation. Uh, the unemployment rate, uh, the poverty, the social and economic uh, uh, disorganization and breakdown is, uh, uh, is risen up to unprecedented levels. And despite uh, all this, the, the government... Uh, uh, according to its commitment with the IMF, uh, is still preparing for uh, more severe uh, taxation on the working class, more severe economic attacks on the working class, privatization, etc. All of this economic crisis is uh, being fairly reflected in the severe political and uh, crisis of state in Pakistan. 
the state institutions, especially the powerful military establishment and the intelligence establishment, they are clearly divided up into various factions that are at uh, war uh, uh, with each other. Uh, various institutions are at war with each other. There are factions within the institutions that are at war with each other. And all of these contending factions of the deep state are also uh, patronizing and backing up various uh, uh, political, uh, bourgeois political parties. And all that uh, uh, st uh, struggle within the ruling class and the state institutions is being reflected in the current political turmoil with the, the fall of the Imran Khan uh, government and the extremely unstable government of Shabash Sharif. Uh, a sim uh, the situation can be gauged from a simple fact that uh, Punjab, that is the largest province uh, and has almost for 55% of the country's population, uh, nobody is sure that uh, uh, who is governing this province and who is its chief minister. It's such a political turmoil. And similarly, uh, uh, the foreign policy of the Pakistani state is in uh, shambles and uh, uh, the military establishment uh, is uh, tr trying, uh, trying to maneuver between, trying to balance between Washington and Beijing. Uh, but the geostrategic and economic contradictions between the US and the Chinese imperialism are uh, tearing apart a weak state like Pakistan. Uh, and against all this uh, backdrop, uh, there are massive uh, uh, political and economic and social attacks on the working class. The private industrial sector in Pakistan uh, 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 represents a level of exploitation and a level of repression uh, uh, which, can, uh, which, are, which resemble to uh, the level of oppression depicted by Charles Dickens in his novels in 1814-1850s Britain. And not only class oppression uh, is uh, heightening up, but also uh, oppression on women, oppression on the youth, and especially oppression on uh, uh, smaller nationalities. There are covert and open uh, military operations going on to uh, suppress uh, the uh, smaller nationalities in Sindh, in former Fata, and especially in Balochistan. But comrades, the most important point is that uh, that uh, the molecular process of revolution, the Pakistani society is speeding up and the anger is reaching the boiling point. Everybody on the street, whether they are workers, they are students, women, small peasants, oppressed nationalities, they are extremely angry and uh, uh, with the state and with the ruling class. And despite their all bravados, the ruling class, the rulers, they are, uh, are very, both the political and the state uh, uh, generals and judges, they're very afraid of a possible Sri Lanka-like situation in Pakistan. Five so there have been left. a lot of uh, uh, worker struggles and strikes in various public sector departments and private industrial areas, um, uh, mass uh, movements of uh, oppressed nationalities and student uh, struggles in the recent past. And all the serious uh, bourgeois commentators can uh, also see that uh, where all of this anger is uh, heading. But it is not only Pakistan uh, in this uh, South Asian South East, South, uh, South Asian region uh, which is uh, having uh, uh, all these uh, contradictions are developing towards a revolution. The situation in neighboring Afghanistan has gone from bad to worse, and there is there is a famine-like situation in in Afghanistan. There is no money uh, uh, with the Taliban government even to purchase the basic necessities like medicine. And there are extensive reports of infighting within the uh, various Taliban uh, factions and the uh, uh, relations between the Taliban government and its uh, uh, patrons, uh, the, uh, the military establishment in Pakistan, they are also uh, going in a bad direction, in a negative direction. The anger against, uh, against the Taliban government, their Pakistani uh, supporters, uh, backers in Islamabad, and against the US imperialism is also rising in the Afghan masses. Uh, which reflects itself in uh, uh, various uh, small to medium-sized protests in various cities of Afghanistan that are usually led by Afghan women. If we talk uh, about the uh, biggest and most important country in this region, uh, India, India is facing uh, the unprecedented levels of unemployment, uh, inflation, and uh, currency devaluation never uh, seen before in its history. But the Indian working class is uh, really gearing up for a huge uh, uh, political and social revolutionary explosion. 
there has been more than uh, seven uh, general strikes, countrywide general strikes in the past six to seven years. And the last two, two days, the countrywide general strike was in, uh, two, uh, was in March this year. Similarly, last year, farmers uh, won a victory against the right-wing uh, populist Modi government, the very oppressive government, after a year-long struggle against the farm laws of the Modi government. But in all these countries, what really lacks is the presence of a uh, Marxist mass leadership armed with the ideas of uh, Marxism, Leninism, Trotskyism. I will perfectly agree with Comrade Ellen that our race is with time, our competition is with time. And we should really speed up our work to build a mass uh, revolutionary uh, party for the work working class. Thank you, comrades. Thank you, comrade Aftab. Now, the first speaker uh, now after the break will be comrade Alex from the German section of the IMT, the Funke. Over the last decade, Germany has been the bulwark of capitalist stability in Europe. But now all economic relations of the German ruling class are strained by imperialist conflict. The ruling class in Germany is sitting between all chairs. It needs cheap Russian energy. It needs the expansion of its zone of influence in Eastern Europe. It needs economic and political ties with the USA, but also trade with China. And above all, it needs the cohesion of the EU under its political dominance. The wealth of the German economy comes from the export of that are particularly energy and capital intensive as cars and machinery. A key to its competitiveness was cheap energy from Russia. But now only 40% of Nord Stream 1's potential and capacity flows to Germany. And it is more expensive now. And ex electricity prices are also exploding. So in consequence, earlier this month, Germany ran a trade deficit for the first time in three decades. The export dependence of German industry is becoming its Achilles heel. Um, cracks are opening in the ruling class and the government. Different wings of the establishment are struggling to find a strategy which the German imperialism can shape its position in the world. The green and liberal warmongers are publicly attacking the social democratic chancellor in whose government they sit. They demand more weapons for Ukraine and an intensification of the war. They verbally go into full confrontation with Russia and China. But this escalation is not in the interest of large parts of the ruling class. They know their dependence on Russia and, Ch on Russia and China, and they see a big social crisis looming. So unity with the NATO is not as strong as it appears at surface. Uh, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz is trying to find a middle way in order to maintain the deep integration of Germany into the global economy. But this strategy is suffering shipwreck in the imperialist war drive. So in order to, uh, to strengthen German imperialist interests, the ruling class rely on rearmament. The government decided on a special fund of 100 billion euro for, for the army and an increase of annual military expenditure. This is a reactionary response to the ruling class to the crisis. Economic nationalism is intensifying. So example of so-called European solidarity. The EU tried to organize centralized purchase and distribution of natural gas, but German industries like RWE oppose this. They want to organize their gas purchases themselves in fear that the EU uh, would allocate them to little gas. Therefore, the German government blocks the EU's plan. The scenario of uh, rationing gas is prepared in Germany. Bosses associations are pushing to give a priority to the industry and not to households. There is a massive propaganda campaign towards the working class to save energy. Also, the government prepares change in legislation, so in winter, families will sit in cold flats. The economy is towards a deep recession. Combined with gas supply shortages, this may lead to the destruction of businesses and a massive rise of unemployment. Already during the pandemic, the state increased its debt by almost 420 billion euros in order to save the social equilibrium. Now the net bailout packages amounting to hundreds of billions are in the pipeline. Uniper, the largest gas intermediary in Germany, is being rescued by the state. A total of 15 billion euros is flowing into the co company. As always, the working class has to pay. Soon there will be a, a drastic price increases for energy. 
The head of the federal network agency said that families could face additional burden of 2,000 to 3,000 euros a year. Inflation will continue to rise. Officially, it is at 7.6%, but everyday goods, it's already 18%. So the masses will not maintain the standards of living. Important um, collective bargaining negotiations are coming in the metal, electrical, and chemical industry, as well as the state employees. But the reformist union leaders are not organizing a united struggle, and they put forward weak demands. But workers are pushing for a fight back. Some make important lessons on the character of the state. So this, the bosses act hand in hand with the state against the workers. For example, the dockers in Hamburg had a confrontation with the police in the collective bargaining round um, just one week ago. And such struggles are just the beginning. So the entire establishment is discussing the potential of a social explosion. The Green Foreign Ministry, Annalena Baerbock, said that in case of massive gas shortages, there will be a social unrest in Germany. So the Social Democratic Interior Minister, Nancy Zer, um, said that the security forces are prepared. So the ruling class understands what they are facing now or what they will face. Big class struggles will soon be on the order of the day. And this will have lasting destabilizing consequences for the German political regime and in consequence for the, for the EU. So in Germany, we are entering a new historical period. And it will be marked by the awakening of the best revolutionary traditions of the ruling uh, working class. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. That was great. The next speaker we have is uh, Comrade Alessio Marconi from the Italian section of the IMT. Well, in really the last week, Italian politics uh, has undergone a real earth earthquake. The Draghi government, which was supported and held by the Italian bourgeoisie and beyond, and had a majority of 554 MPs out of 630, to give you an idea, collapsed within a few days. The political crisis is so deep that the President of the Republic was forced to call snap elections. And this is the first time in the history of the Italian Republic that parliamentary elections will be held in the autumn. When budget laws are being discussed, and a stable government has always been guaranteed. Well, it could seem inexplicable, uh, this collapse uh, uh, for a superficial observer, but the truth is that Italy is a perfect example of the inability of the ruling class to preserve stable instruments of political government in a context of a general crisis of the system. Draghi was imposed by the bourgeoisie to restore order in the institutions and manage the recovery plan. But doing so, they only moved the instability into the parties themselves. And so the government was eventually overwhelmed by the, cri the crisis of the parties and the entire political system. The bourgeoisie had moved in his support in a big way. In the last days of the government, Draghi had uh, received public support uh, from the Bosses Association, from former ministers, from the Catholic Church, from 2,000 majors, from university rectors, and from the, of course, from, from the international press, uh, from Sanchez, uh, even from Zelensky, and even from the president of the Italian Olympic Committee. But all this was not enough. The truth is that while the newspapers paint Draghi as he were a saint, the trust in the government and the entire political system among the people was collapsing. In a recent poll, 65.3% of Italians said they had little or no trust at all in the political class. And only 6.3% said they had a strong trust. After months of a suffocating patriotic campaign and belligerent campaign, only 16% of Italians declared themselves in favor of sending arms to Kiev. So you can understand the government rhetoric demanding sacrifices from the workers in the name of peace is rejected on a mass level. In fact, the crisis of Draghi government manifested itself on the parliamentary terrain, but matured day by day in the increasingly hard 
lives conditions of tens of millions of workers, uh, young people, and pensioners. In Italy, real wages have fallen by 2.9 percent from 1990. And this with now an official inflation of 8 percent, that is the highest since uh, 1986 and still rising. Three out of four households are significantly reducing their spending on food and health care. Four million people are unable to pay their bills and risk having gas and electricity cut off. And now the European Central Bank's decision to raise interest rates will put an enormous pressure on Italy's public debt, which already stands above 150%. It's, uh, I think, 152% now of the GDP. And, and the fact that uh, any uh, European support, uh, uh, you know, there is this, this plan to support weaker, uh, weaker countries, any European support will be conditional on budget uh, uh, constraints, uh, will force a progressive return to austerity measures. Uh, after the 2020-21 uh, public spending uh, policies, Draghi had already started uh, to cut uh, uh, subsidies, uh, especially sub sub subsidies uh, to the lower classes. All, all these, these, these cuts that uh, are being prepared in a situation where, for example, there is already a crisis in the health system with a shortage of doctors and, and patients abandoned in the corridors of uh, emergency rooms. I read today on the newspaper that a doctor died of a heart attack, uh, attack after working for 24 hours straight. So you can understand the perspectives was already uh, that of an imminent explosion of class struggle. But now this is combined with the political crisis and the fact that the next election will most likely be won by the center right but this most right than, than center since a decisive role uh, will be played by the post-fascist party uh, brotherhood of Italy, brothers of Italy. So the ruling, the ruling class is terrified and, and it is right to be so. Of course, they have no doubt that the right wing will defend uh, their interests, but they are worried because uh, they will do so by directly provoking the labor movement and young people. So classist attacks uh, on trade union rights, uh, layoffs uh, uh, on school health care will be combined by the whole reactionary armamentarium of xenophobia, sexism, homophobia and repression. And, and this is a recipe for the explosion of uh, labor movement and youth movement. In fact, we could say the perfect storm is gathering. So the turning point that has occurred in the last few days uh, moves us into an explosive phase of the class struggle at an accelerated pace. The political reference point on the left is completely missing and the union Who leadership is, is paralyzed. I think the, the, the CGIL, it's the, 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 the major trade union, uh, had, had leadership had even made an appeal for the Draghi government to remain in charge. But you see, the, the, the entry of the working class will change the whole picture in society, on the political terrain and within the union. And honestly, uh, we are lucky to have so many international examples uh, of such uh, uh, processes to learn for, from. We will be the only ones to advance a clear revolutionary perspective and to invest our energy so that this perspective can assert itself in the real terrain of the class struggle and uh, convince the best elements. So along these lines, uh, the Italian section of the IMT is preparing for the autumn ahead with the awareness of the clash that is preparing, with the clarity that comes from Marxist analysis and with the optimism for the incomparable strength of the working class. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alessio. That was very good. Uh, the next speaker will be Comet Ubaldo from uh, the Mexican section of the IMT. Todo el continente en América está siendo arrastrado a un nuevo periodo de lucha de clases. The entire American continent is being dragged uh, into a new uh, period in the class struggle. 
la pandemia fue un desastre, principalmente para países, para países como Perú o México, donde los índices de exceso de muertes llegaron a niveles brutales. The pandemic was a complete disaster, especially for countries like uh, Mexico or Peru, where the death toll was, uh, was uh, reached um, uh, um, um, unseen levels. En Perú, por ejemplo, fallecieron uno por cada 130, 130 personas. Esto es 10 veces mayor a la media mundial. In Peru, for instance, uh, one in every 130 uh, people died uh, because of COVID. This is uh, 10, 10 times the global average. En términos económicos, también tuvo efectos catastróficos. Economically, uh, the impact of the pandemic was also catastrophic. En el 2020, todas las economías cayeron y tuvieron un repunte al siguiente año. Sin embargo, los salarios no se han recuperado y se, eh, y se encuentran un 6.8% por debajo del periodo prepandemia. The year 2020 was, uh, saw a, a, a drastic slump uh, in the economies of uh, Latin America. There was a recovery in 2021, but uh, wages did not recover. They are still 6.8% uh, on average uh, uh, behind pre-pandemic levels. Ahora mismo hay una ola de inflación, como en todo el mundo. La CEPAL ha dicho que los más afectados serán las mujeres y los jóvenes. As uh, everywhere, we see uh, a spike in inflation in Latin America, and the CEPAL uh, points out that the, 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 those who will suffer the most will be women uh, and the youth. Mientras que el crecimiento estimado para la zona en este año es de 1.8%, la inflación promedio será de 8.1%, afectando principalmente a los alimentos y los energéticos. Growth this year will be of 1.8%, uh, whereas inflation will reach 8.1% and will be, uh, uh, will, uh, will, be more, will be stronger among uh, foods, food and the energy prices. La pobreza se ha incrementado como fruto de la pandemia y la inflación. Extreme poverty has, has also increased as a consequence of, uh, of uh, the pandemic and of, and of inflation. La pobreza extrema también se ha incrementado llegando a un 90, a 94.2 millones de personas que no tienen para completar los alimentos al día. Yes, uh, extreme uh, poverty now affects 94.2 million uh, people who have uh, trouble uh, getting enough uh, food uh, to get by the day. No solo es un problema económico, la pandemia ha incrementado la deserción escolar hasta en un 14% y la violencia a la mujer en las casas llegó a picos brutales. El peor lugar es México con 340, perdón, 3,462 asesinatos de la mujer durante el 2020. But uh, the, this is not simply an economic uh, problem. For instance, uh, the pandemic led to a, a hike in, uh, in school dropouts that increased by 14%. And also we saw an increase in violence against uh, women. In this respect, uh, the, the, the worst uh, country is uh, Mexico, where uh, 3,462 women were murdered uh, in 2020. En el mismo periodo, los grandes millonarios han incrementado sus fortunas de forma escandalosa, abriendo la brecha entre ricos y pobres. At the same time, in this very same uh, period, uh, The, the super rich increased their, their fortunes, widening the gap between the rich and the poor. El número de multimillonarios de la región subió de 76 a 107. El total de su fortuna acumulada escaló de 284 mil millones de dólares a 480 mil millones de dólares. The number of uh, multimillionaires in Latin America increased uh, in, in those uh, years of the pandemic. Uh, from 76 to 107 multimillionaires, and the total fortune went from uh, 284 billion dollars to 480 billion dollars. La acumulación de capital crece aceleradamente, y por otro por el otro lado, las masas sufren. On the one hand, uh, the accumulation of uh, of uh, capital is uh, intensified, and on the other hand, uh, the suffering of the masses uh, increases. Esto es material inflamable en toda la región. Todo el continente está siendo sacudido por movilizaciones de masas. En algunos lugares hay intentos insurreccionales. And this uh, is creating a, a powder keg in the, in the region. The whole continent is being shaken by mass uh, mobilization. And in some uh, places we have seen uh, insurrectionary movements.
cuando a las masas se les cierra la posibilidad de ir más allá en las calles por su dirección, viran al terreno electoral y están provocando inestabilidad política en toda la región. When the lack of uh, leadership blocks uh, the insurrectionary road, blocks uh, the movement on the streets, the masses reorient to the elect electoral front, and this is uh, provoking uh, political instability across the region. El paro general en junio de 18 días en Ecuador da muestra de esto que estamos diciendo. The general strike uh, that uh, lasted for 18 days uh, in Ecuador is, uh, is a very clear example of what uh, I'm describing. Este paro fue convocado por la CONAI y movilizó a decenas de miles en todo el país. Algunas regiones tuven, tuvieron dimensiones insurreccionales. This uh, stoppage was promoted by the indigenous uh, organization CONAIE and it uh, brought out ten, tens, of, uh, tens of thousands onto the streets and the movement in some, uh, in some parts of the country reached um, insurrectionary dimensions. Aunque el paro tuvo deficiencias serias en su dirección, particularmente porque una acción así planteaba el tema del poder, la dirección no planteó una idea clara sobre este tema. However, this uh, general stoppage uh, had uh, serious handicaps in its uh, leadership, basically because uh, such a movement raises the question of, uh, of power and the leadership did not have a clear position on this. No obstante eso, el gobierno del banquero Lazo tuvo que hacer concesiones serias para desmovilizar. Nevertheless, the government of the banker Lazo uh, had to make serious concessions in order to, uh, to derail and deactivate the, the movement. Entre las conquistas, se logró reducir el precio de la gasolina, el del diésel, frenar las concesiones mineras en ciertas zonas, mayor presupuesto para el sistema de salud y subsidios a fertilizantes, entre otras. Some of the conquests of this uh, movement was the reduction in the price of uh, diesel and uh, gasoline. Uh, some uh, mining concessions were in, in certain regions were, were blocked. And uh, Una... the budget for, for healthcare oh. and uh, the subsidies for fertilizers were increased. Una cosa importante es que es el sector de la izquierda de la CONAE, particularmente Leonidas Isa, su dirigente, salió fortalecido y la confianza entre los sectores indígenas y la juventud es de victoria. The most important uh, consequence of the, of the stoppage is that the left wing of the CONAIE, of the indigenous movement, led by uh, Leonidas Isa, was uh, strengthened by all this, and uh, the, among the youth and the indigenous population, there is a feeling of confidence and of victory. Otro país que ha tenido movilizaciones importantes es Perú. Another country that witnessed uh, big mobilizations is Perú. Pedro Castillo llegó a la presidencia en medio de una crisis política del régimen que ya dura años. Pedro Castillo uh, came to power in the midst of a deep political crisis that uh, has been going on for years. Llegó apoyado por los partidos y organizaciones de izquierda. Sin embargo, en cada ocasión en que la burguesía le ha presionado, él ha cedido, él ha cedido deshaciéndose de los sectores más a la izquierda y reorganizando su gabinete con personeros de la oligarquía. He was uh, propelled to power by uh, the organizations and the parties of the left. But whenever the bourgeoisie put pressure on him, he always uh, capitulated, uh, purging the, the left-wing uh, sectors and uh, redesigning his uh, cabinet uh, following the, the, the guidance of the, of the oligarchy. Esto ha desmoralizado a sus seguidores y causado una crisis entre los sectores que le impulsaron. This has demoralized his uh, followers and led to a crisis among uh, the movement that uh, brought him to power. Su programa reformista se ha ido diluyendo rápidamente, manteniendo la idea de la Asamblea Constituyente como único vínculo entre él y fuertes sectores del movimiento que tienen esperanzas en ella. His reformist uh, program has gradually been uh, watered down to the point that his only, uh, his main slogan now is uh, the Constituent Assembly which uh, is the only link he has with, uh, with his uh, social base. El gobierno de Castillo es un claro ejemplo que en un momento de crisis el reformismo no puede mantenerse entre dos fuegos o apoya a los trabajadores o a la burguesía. This is a clear example that in times of crisis, uh, reformists cannot serve uh, two masters. They must uh, either uh, take the side of the workers or of the uh, bourgeoisie. Castillo se ha inclinado a apoyar a la burguesía, a pesar de que ésta no ha perdido una oportunidad para destituirlo. Castillo has uh, sided 
with the ruling class, uh, but the ruling class has not uh, forgotten about uh, about its uh, agenda to get rid of him. Una parte de la burguesía quiere deshacerse de él. Otra piensa que eso abriría una crisis revolucionaria. Lo quiere mantener como títere para para que atienda la crisis y tratar de contener la posible insurrección del pueblo. Part of the bourgeoisie wants to get rid of him uh, immediately. Uh, but another sector thinks that uh, such a move would unleash a revolutionary crisis. So they want to keep him in power so that he can uh, put a check on, the, on, the, on, a, on a possible insurrection by the people. También ha habido movilizaciones por el alto costo de los energéticos y de, lo, de la canasta básica en Panamá. Uh, there, has also, there have also been protests against the price of uh, fuel and of uh, the, the food basket in, uh, in Panama. Pero el caso más emblemático en este periodo ha sido la victoria de Gustavo Petro en Colombia. But the most uh, significant uh, case in this period has been the victory of Gustavo Petro in Colombia. Esta victoria es resultado directo del paro nacional, el cual duró tres meses a pesar de la brutal de represión el año pasado, donde la juventud y los sectores explotados sin una dirección impulsaron una lucha poniendo sobre las cuerdas al gobierno de Duque y al uribismo. Uh, his victory was the direct uh, consequence of the general strike, the Paro Nacional uh, of uh, last year, that went on for three months despite brutal uh, repression. Uh, the el, youth and, the, and the, the oppressed came out to the streets and fought against the government uh, despite the fact that they did not have a, a leadership and they put uh, Duque in a very difficult situation. El Paro fue una inspiración para todo el continente. Su motor fue la juventud. The strike was a source of inspiration for, for uh, the entire continent, and its driving force was the youth. La victoria de Petro, a pesar de su programa, fue un giro de las masas de la calle a la vía electoral. Ha sido un acontecimiento histórico, pues es la primera vez que un gobierno de izquierda reformista llega a la presidencia. Uh, the victory of uh, Petro uh, took place despite his program, and it was uh, the result of a, of a turn among the masses from the streets to the electoral uh, front, and this is a historical victory because it is the first time that the left reformist comes to power in Colombia. El triunfo ha desatado una ola de esperanza entre los colombianos. Sin embargo, el gobierno reformista será una dura escuela para las masas. His uh, victory has uh, generated tremendous expectations amongst uh, Colombians. However, his uh, reformist government will be a very hard school for the masses. En su primer discurso ha dicho que su proyecto no, no, no es terminar con el capitalismo, sino desarrollarlo. In his first uh, speech during his inauguration, he said that his, uh, that his uh, aim is not to abolish uh, capitalism, but rather to uh, develop it, which is, uh, which is uh, rubbish. Pero aún con las pequeñas reformas que ha planteado, una tímida reforma agraria, un plan de jubilaciones decente, evitar el saqueo de los recursos natura naturales, habrá un sector de la burguesía que no va a ceder y luchará por terminar con su gobierno. However, uh, even the very modest uh, reforms that he's uh, putting forward, such, a, such as a very timid uh, land reform, uh, a, a, a reform to the pension system to increase the pensions, uh, and to stop the pillage of natural resources will lead to a rebellion of the bourgeoisie against him. They will fight against this government. Se abrirá un periodo de lucha de clases y el gobierno mostrará sus límites, igual que la burguesía mostrará su verdadera, verdadera cara y saldrá a la luz la necesidad de la lucha por el socialismo. There will, this will open a phase of intense uh, class struggle. The government will show uh, its uh, limits and the bourgeoisie will also reveal its true uh, face, and this will all, uh, this will all uh, show the need for socialism. Lo que vemos en todo el continente es el mismo proceso moviéndose a ritmos diferentes. To see across the continent is the same process that uh, takes different forms and moves at different rhythms. La crisis orgánica del capital en la región está haciendo insoportable la vida para millones, pero la clase obrera y la juventud van a responder como hasta ahora hemos visto. Uh, the organic crisis of capitalism in the region is making life unbearable for millions of uh, workers, for youth, for women, but they will respond uh, in, in the way that, they've been, uh, that, that we've been seeing. Nuestra tarea por la construcción del Partido Revolucionario es urgente en toda la región. Our task is to build a revolutionary party across the region, and this is more urgent now than ever. Gracias. Thank you very much, Ubaldo.
The next speaker will be Comrade Ilva from the Swedish section. Hi comrades, greetings from Sweden, Motala. So when the Ukraine war broke out, an ear deafening campaign was launched in Sweden. The message was that Russia invading Ukraine was only the first step. Soon Russian soldiers might crawl out of the uh, Baltic Sea onto the small Swedish island of uh, Gotland to then launch a full scale invasion of Sweden. Now this campaign had a very clear aim to whip up enough fear to convince Swedes of the need to join NATO. And this had an effect. For the first time, a majority was obtained in the polls for a NATO membership. And so the Swedish social democratic government hurried in changing their views in favor of a membership, abandoning the old so-called neutrality. Of course, in reality, Sweden has never been neutral. As a weak imperialist country, it has balanced between other more powerful nations, collaborating with both Nazi Germany and the Allied forces during the Second World War. And during the post-war period, the formal neutrality was a useful tool for the bourgeoisie and the social democracy in deceiving workers. Cultivating this image of a peaceful, nice, neutral Sweden, whilst in reality collaborating closely with the US. And ever since the fall of the Soviet Union, step by step, they have collaborated more and more openly and closely with the US and NATO. With increased participation in imperialist interventions like that in Afghanistan, now the social democracy, the right wing and the ruling class has a much greater use of diverting the attention from workers' real problems by pointing towards the so-called threat from the East, rather than putting all their efforts into upholding this image of uh, this nicer Swedish capitalism, which is becoming more and more difficult anyway. And there are also many possibilities that are advantageous to uh, the Swedish ruling class in joining NATO. Since the fall of the Soviet Union, the Swedish capitalists have invested ever more capital in the Baltic countries. Two Swedish banks now own more than half of the uh, Baltic banking system. In joining NATO, Sweden will not be a voice of peace uh, or whatever nonsense they might claim. It will be one of the fiercest advocators of a hard line towards Russia to defend its imperialist interests in the Baltic countries against Russia. But the process of joining NATO was not as uh, smooth as they claimed it would be. For months, the message in the media in Sweden was that all NATO countries were waiting with open arms for Sweden and Finland, and that the process would be quick and painless. And they claimed that the biggest risk of a Russian invasion would be during the application process. So therefore it was important to move very fast. But then Erdogan stepped in and decided to use the conflict between the US and Russia to get as many concessions for Turkey as possible. And though it now looks like Sweden will be let in unless Erdogan thinks of other things and the Swedish bourgeoisie is thrilled about it. Joining NATO also comes uh, with a heavy price for Swedish capitalism. Just like the pandemic exposed the crisis of Swedish welfare, this will be another big blow to the image of Sweden as a much nicer capitalist country or perhaps even a socialist country. The dirty deal made with Turkey in selling out the Kurds was only the first step. The increased sales of Swedish weapons will also get more spotlight. And this together with growing class contradictions political polarization, rising inflation, a housing bubble dangerously close to bursting, having among the most indebted households in Europe and poisonous racist propaganda. A NATO membership is only going to add further instability for Swedish capitalism. And Sweden is joining NATO at a time of ever growing conflicts between the NATO allies. And what this means is that all those countries that yesterday looked quiet and peaceful, those who on the surface might still look quiet and peaceful, 
are one by one revealing the most glaring contradictions. The time has come for class struggle and revolutions everywhere, also in Sweden and the rest of Scandinavia. And that means that the time has come for us Marxists. And we must make the most of it and build with urgency the forces of Marxism. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ilva. That was uh, truly excellent. We will now have the, uh, the final intervention of this session by Rob Sewell, who is uh, from the British section of the IMT, Socialist Appeal. It's not that long ago that the British bourgeoisie used to sneer at the European counterparts. They would laugh at the instability in Europe, especially in Italy. Oh yes, they had a, they had a very good laugh. Every few months, governments would collapse. Whereas in Br Britain, of course, in contrast, it was the epitome of, of stability. And of course, there was some truth in this, because for decades, Britain was considered probably the most stable country in Europe. And the success of the Tory party was the envy of bourgeois parties on the continent. But uh, as the Bible says, you know, the first should be last and the last should be first. And uh, they're not laughing now that Britain has become probably one of the most unstable countries in Europe. In fact, the contradictions are building so rapidly that we're on the verge of a social explosion. And these days, the Tory party, the Conservative party, this great success resembles today the inside of a lunatic asylum. As Alan has said, dialectically, everything has been turned on its head. Ever since 2015, Britain has been hit by a series of shocks. You had the dramatic rise of uh, Scottish independence. You had the, the shock of uh, the vote for Brexit, uh, the election of Jeremy Corbyn as the leader of the Labour Party. And now we have the uh, present unprecedented turmoil. But these uh, separate crises were simply tremors of a future earthquake. As one uh, bourgeois commentator said recently, this autumn, Britain will be hit with the financial cataclysm. It is like, uh, and other comrades have mentioned it, it's like a perfect storm where all the contradictions are coming to the fore. And what a change, what an incredible change. I mean, for the last 40 years, I would say, the industrial front has been practically dead. Strikes were few and far between. Now, with the working class is facing an inflation of 10 or 12 percent, in other words, big cuts in real wages, together with uh, energy prices are going up a further 65 percent in October, a whole layer of workers are taking action or voting for strike action. Uh, Alan mentioned them, from railway workers to barristers of all people. This has come on the backs of years of attacks on the working class. And layers of workers who have never been on strike before are moving into action. And despite the fact that Britain's anti-trade union laws, where workers are forced to vote uh, by ballot for, stri for strike action, that many have voted between 95% and even 99% in favor of strike action. And uh, what's remarkable is the public sympathy for these votes, for these uh, strikes. And to show the, the, the mood developing in Britain, you had the reactionary Murdoch newspaper called uh, The Sun, or uh, The Sun, uh, had a front page, class war, the whole front page. You know, Marx once explained that uh, the revolution sometimes needs the whip of the counter-revolution to drive it forward. Here we have the whip of a cost of living crisis, which is pr promoting the class struggle. And this uh, shift in the, in, in the class struggle represents, without doubt, a reawakening of the British working class. Yeah, after a 40 year sleep, it is a turning point in the class struggle as we predicted. Of course, the ruling class is, is extremely alarmed. Britain has once again become the sick man of Europe although Italy obviously competes as well for that. In fact, next year, according to the OECD, out of the 20 G, sorry, the G20 countries, Britain will be the worst affected apart from Russia. I mean, inflation is the highest in the G7. 
And on top of this, the crisis of Brexit is threatening to ignite a new trade war with Europe. So this is a, a disastrous situation for British capitalism, as well as a disaster for the working class. As a result, the trade union leaders are under enormous pressure from below to take action. That's why the possibility of a general strike is inherent in the situation. At the same time, you have a government in pa paralysis. It's a paralysed government. Uh, Johnson was forced out after 50 ministers resigned from his government. So this is not just a, a, go a, a government of crisis. You've got a, a crisis of the regime. And, and Britain, at this stage, at this vital stage, is run by, yes, as Alan said, lunatics, madmen. But the problem the bourgeois will have is not just to get rid of Boris Johnson, but the people who could replace him could be worse than Johnson. There's an election now, and the, the favourite to win is a person called Liz Truss. And, and she wanted to go even further than Johnson in scrapping the Northern Ireland Agreement and provoking a trade war with Europe. So, so if she wins, which is, I think, likely, it's going to be an ongoing deep, crisis in British capitalism and what we have in what has been prepared in Britain after so long this is the development of yes of a pre-revolutionary crisis of course this crisis will be a protracted one it'll, it'll go over a long period of time but the but, but the process has begun the ruling class is in disarray and the working class is on the move we're in a stormy period of a sharp and sudden changes in consciousness how long this government will last, we don't know. It could, could collapse at any time. And then the bourgeoisie might turn to Keir Starmer, the Labour leader, to form a government. But it, it will be the same. They'll have the same policies as the Tory government. In other words, it will also be a government of crisis. And it's on these events, these huge events that are coming, that is going to transform the consciousness of the masses. This is not going to be a straight line. On the contrary, there's going to be ups and downs in the class struggle. But out of this experience will come the stealing of the British working class. And therefore, I say that Trotsky's writings on Britain have never been more relevant than they are today. And therefore, our, our task must be to realise what's coming and prepare ourselves for the mighty events that impend. And the inevitable move at a certain point towards the British Revolution. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rob. Uh, comrades, this has been a, a really marvelous discussion. I'd like to thank all the comrades for their speeches today. They've been full of lessons from the class struggle all over the world. So, Alan, if you're ready, take it away. Well, comrades, I think it's been, as Samid said, a marvelous discussion. And uh, the underlying theme of all the interventions, they were all very good, by the way, all the, all the comments spoke well. But like a, a, a red thread running through the whole discussion is the general tendency towards polarization, the breakdown of the political center, as Jerome explained in relation to France. Yeah. And what that means fundamentally is an increasing tendency towards class struggle. Now, it's interesting, you know, they were the, uh, this... Uh, We've had, we, we had a lot of success with our theoretical journal in defense of Marxism. And in the present issue, there's a very interesting article by, by Comrade John Peterson from, uh, from New York about the American Civil War. Now, this is a, a more relevant subject than what you might think, because believe it or not, there's an active discussion taking place in, in the USA at, the, at this moment in time on the subject, can there be a civil war in the USA today? It was first raised, as a matter of fact, in the Davos conference last year. It was discussed then. And since then, there's been a number of books on the subject, sell it, selling very well, apparently. One of them is by a person called Barbara F. Walter, with a fascinating title, How Civil Wars Start and How to Stop Them. If anyone sees Barbara, tell her from me, it's far easier to start one than to finish one. But there we are. But to go back to polarization. It is quite clear that in, in, in November, the midterm elections, the Democrats are, be, are, going to be, are going to be decimated. I don't have any doubts about it. Which poses a question in, in 2024 that tr Trump might well return to power. Now, whether or not all of this leads in, in, to civil war is not at all clear to me. I think it's a little bit premature. But that the seeds of a future civil war are, are being sown at this moment in time is entirely possible. You know, 
or more correctly, because they want to avoid the word revolution, you see, more, more correctly, the seeds are being sown for an almighty social explosion. And that's inevitable at the moment in, in the United States, yes. You know, as a matter of fact, even now, as Tom, Tom pointed out in his excellent intervention, there's no shortage of combustible material in US society and, and politics right now, like this question of abortion. So it's just waiting for a conflagration, They're just, just waiting for a spark then to, to, to set up a conflagration. And it, 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 it may well be that the victory of Trump, which I think is quite likely, will, be, will provide such a spark. See, what's the, what's the problem here? What's the problem in every single case? It's the absence of a coherent point of reference. And in America, given, the, given that, 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 that absence, the only point that people can see is precisely Donald Trump again. Well, I'll make a prediction now. I'll make a prediction. I'll make a prediction now. Under conditions of a deep capitalist crisis, the, ex the experience of a Trump administration will finish Trump for good. It will expose him completely. And it will serve to deepen all the contradictions and create the conditions for the emergence of a whole new generation of revolutionary fighters. And I'll make another prediction. Many of them will be former Trumpites. Many of them. They swing violently, they swing violently from the extreme right to the extreme left. I predict that now. Now, I'll come to Oleg from Russia again, made a very interesting intervention, as always. And I agree with him. At this, at this stage, Putin has got support among the working class, yes. Big support among the Russian working class. And the, the, the main weakness of, of the anti-war movement in, in Russia is very simple. It's identified with the bourgeois liberals, and that's the kiss of death. The, the workers hate them. They distrust them completely. And the anti-war movement can never succeed in breaking through to the Russian working class unless it breaks from the bourgeois liberals first. Is that surprising? It's not really surprising. The Russian workers may not like Putin very much, but they hate U.S. imperialism and they hate NATO which they rightly see as an enemy as a, and as a threat. Now, there's not yet, a, as Ali correctly said, there's not yet a revolutionary situation in Russia, but that can change. Of course, it can change. The masses in Russia will put up with quite a lot for quite a long time. They will put up. But if the war drags on for too long, and we don't know, we don't know how, so people have asked, how long will it last? Well, I answer, how long is a piece of string, my friend? You can't answer that. If it drags on for longer, then, of course, the, the mood of the masses will, will change. There's no, no two ways about it. And again, what's the problem? If I was in Russia, I've been in Russia, I've made the same one. I would say the same thing I always say. There's only one problem in Russia. If the Communist Party of Russia was a Communist Party, there'd be no problem. But it's not. And that, as, as Alec explained. Now, on the question of the war, by the way, let's, let's be clear about one thing, in case there's any doubt in anybody's mind. Look, it is a matter of complete and utter indifference to us which side wins in, the, in this war. Complete indifference. If Russia uh, loses, I don't think they will, but if they, if they do lose, it will mean the collapse of uh, Putin almost immediately, I think, and the beginnings of a, a revolution in Russia, which we welcome. But if Russia wins, that will be a body blow to, to U.S. imperialism and NATO and all, all the right-wing scoundrels and rubbish that, that support them. And that would suit us also very well. Would suit us very well. So we don't worry about that. That's fine. Anyway, we'll see what happens. Now, I've, I've mentioned uh, 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 Jorge Martin, as usual, spoke very well on the Ukraine. He said, and, 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 and he mentioned the unprecedented barrage of propaganda. I've never seen anything like it. It reminds me of what Joseph, Joseph Goebbels used to say. You know, Goebbels, Hitler, Hitler's propaganda minister. He was a smart guy, Goebbels. He was a bastard, but a, a smart bastard. They're the most dangerous sort. And he said, if you, look, if you want to tell a lie, don't tell a little, please don't tell a little lie. Little lies are no good to anybody. No, tell a big lie. A big, the bigger, the better. The bigger and most blatant, uh, gross lie like, that you can think of. And if you repeat it and repeat it and repeat it, eventually people will believe it. And that, that's how he's, he had a point. There's no two ways about it. Because this barrage of propaganda has had an effect. There's no two ways about it. Yeah, but that will not, that lie will not resist the pressure of, of great events. It's going to be exposed, mercilessly, cruelly exposed. Oh, yes, solidarity, they're all united. Aren't they all united? Yeah, you know, you, you've got to believe they're all united because they say they're all united. So it must be true. Don't you believe what the press says? What's the matter? What, haven't we got a free press? <laughs> free press, my ass. <laughs> 
you know, Boris Johnson, well, he's, he's just, uh, the poor, poor man has just lost power. You're going you're gonna to feel sorry for him. You know? But he showed the real meaning of solidarity. He did the stupid thing. He's, all, he's always doing the stupid things. You know? He said what he thinks. It's not a good policy, comrades, for a, for a professional politician to say what he thinks. That's a very bad thing indeed. Anyway, what what is the, what are the Brits going to do if if the Europeans are sort of gassed this winter and freezing in their houses? What are the Brits going to do? He said he intends to cut off gas supplies to mainland Europe under an emergency plan. With the, with the when when if Russia, if Russia cuts off the gas, yes, they, they, they start by cutting off the pipelines to, to the Netherlands and Belgium. So you better buy some extra blankets, Eric. Okay. Well, you know. It reminds me of the old Chinese proverb, you know. What do you do when you see a man falling? Answer, give him a push. <laughs> Long live international unity and solidarity. That's the capitalist system for you girls and boys. That's what it is. And then Comrade Ilva made an interesting comment. So Putin's going to invade Sweden now, is he? I don't know why he should do a thing like that, but there you are. And now I've heard everything. Ah, not quite, not quite everything, Irva, not quite everything. I'll tell you something. This terrible Putin, he wants to invade Britain as well. Yes, he's planning to invade us as well. I mean, it's a bit silly, really, on his part, a silly mistake. Why should the British people want to be ruled by a corrupt individual who believes he's above the law, has no principles, is a, is a systematic liar, and is only motivated by the possession of wealth and personal power. Why would, you, why would you want something like that when we've already got it, for Christ's sake? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Anyway, he's gone now. Leave him alone. Comrade Afran dealt uh, very effectively with the effects of the war in Pakistan. I won't repeat uh, what, what he said. Just to say that all the points that the comrades made all were leading in the same direction. Inexorably, inexorably. A, a movement in the direction of greater class struggle and revolution. Including Germany, you know. I, I thought our comrade Alex always speaks very well, and uh, the the Greens and the Liberals are the worst uh, warmongers. They want they want to, they they wouldn't mind if there was a third world war. It looks like, of course, they're pacifists. So you'd expect that from pacifists, but you know, a love a lovely world war. Everyone goes up in 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 nuclear bombs and so on. That's okay. That's okay. Yeah. Yes, they are also very stupid. Their policy, well, it reminds me of something the French diplomat said. You was it Talleyrand? I can't remember. C'est pire qu'un crime. C'est une faute. It's worse than a crime. It's a mistake. <laughs> Typical of the diplomats, you know. Anyway, they soon be, those those bastards are soon going to be woke, woken up with a bump. Comes the winter when things get cold. And the bosses, the greedy German bosses, want all the gas for themselves. And let people, let the, let the old age pensioners freeze to death in their houses. What do we care? That will go down well in Germany, won't it? <laughs> you know. That will sharpen up the class struggle in Germany very nicely. Thank you very much. And the German workers, who, it's true, they've been dormant for a long time, the German working class. But be warned, comrades, don't write off the German workers too soon. Under these conditions... The German workers can quickly catch up with the Greeks, the French, and the Italian working class. And as Alex, as, as Alex said, they will return to the best traditions of the past, the real traditions of Germany, the German working class, which we stand for, and we, we are proud that we stand for those traditions. Traditions of Marx, Engels, Rosa Luxemburg, and Karl Liebknecht. That's our traditions. Um, unless you, again, made all the points and listened to Italy, there's no need to elaborate that. And again, it's another, there's another general feature, isn't there? There's another general feature. One by one, the old parties and leaders are being put to the test. Not in uh, words, but in practice. Yes. And they're all found wanting, as the Bible would put it. They've been found wanting. They've been weighed in the scales and found wanting. There's a general hatred towards all the traditional parties, as a matter of fact. The, uh, before people had illusions in these parties. They'd always vote for the same party. Not anymore, not anymore. It's finished. And there's, a, there's enormous anger building against all of them. Tremendous anger building up. And uh, therefore, th th this, this is true in Italy. Uh, and as you said, that the, 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 the majority of, of the Italian workers have no time for any of the parties. It's a, you said, he said that what, you, what you've just seen in the last week in Italy was, an, was a political earthquake, and that's correct. The Draghi government was supposed to be a strong government. 
It collapsed like a house of cards in the space of one week. The ruling class don't, don't want new elections, but there'll have to be new elections. And it's, it's quite possible, I think it's quite probable that there'll, there'll be a right-wing coalition government. And I can, I can imagine all of the, the fake lefts going around clutching and go, oh, look at your reaction, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear, oh. <laughs> You just just laugh at laugh at those people. It's a concrete question. All right, so there's a right wing coalition government in Italy. What can they do in conditions of the of deep capitalist crisis? You tell me. What can they do? No, they they will be exposed very quickly, and uh, they, they'll collapse as quickly as they 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 they'll go up like a a rocket come and come down like a stick. And then what? Sometimes they in the past, not not anymore. I'm glad I'm glad to see that. Not anymore. But the Italian Commons used to used to complain about, oh look, there's no workers' party in Italy. There's no workers' party. And that's quite right. There is no workers' party in Italy. In the yeah, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, I'll tell you. <clears throat> in the past, in, in 1969, for example, and I've, I'm I'm convinced. I'm convinced. I have no doubt about it. The conditions of building up for a repetition of 1969, 1968-69 in Italy. Massive general strike, factory occupations, the lot, the mass demonstrations. Same in Pakistan, by the way. Same in France. It's the traditions, the old traditions. Now, here's, here's the point. Here's the problem for the ruling class. And it's a big problem. What saved, what saved their bacon? What saved them in France and Italy in 1968-69? What saved them? The, the existence of a powerful Stalinist party that controlled the unions and had no wish to take power. You know, at the beginning of the general strike in France, General de Gaulle was the president, supposed to be a strong man. Wasn't a strong man at all. Once the workers began to move, this strong man was reduced to nothing. And the American ambassador, I think his name is Carlucci, Frank Carlucci, if comments were correct. He was alarmed at the developments in France. He went to see de Gaulle. He said, what, what, what's happening? What's happening? Workers are seizing the factories. 10 million workers seizing the factories. You know what uh, de Gaulle told Carlucci? He said, it's all up, it's all finished, the game's up. In a few days, the communists will be in power. De Gaulle said that, I didn't say it, de Gaulle said that. And that should have been the case. But the so-called communists didn't want power. It's the last thing they wanted. The Stalinists saved the, the, the French capitalist system in 1968. No two ways about it. And the Stalinists saved it in Italian capitalism in 1969. No two ways about that either. But now there's no communist party in Italy, and there's no communist party to speak of in France either. What does that mean? Italian capitalism is like a car which is going downhill without any brakes, without any brakes. Don't you understand that the reform is, the function of the reform is to act as a brake on the movement. No reformist party or no reformist trade union leaders, no brakes. And therefore the, the whole situation will be out of control very quickly. Revolution will be on the cards, even without a party. The, the working class is not like it's not like an orchestra that needs a conductor to, to be conducting all the time. You know, the working class is not going to wait for us. You know, somebody asked me. They, sometimes they ask me, "Well, when, when will the workers move, Alan? When will the workers move?" In Britain, for example, I've asked. That, I was asked that question many times. Comrades, to that question, I'll give you a very precise answer. The working class will move. When they are ready, not one moment before, not one minute afterwards. Yeah, but we have to be prepared for this, you know. The biggest mistake that communists can make in any country, because things are moving slowly, because there's no sign of anything taking place, that we are not prepared. What happened in France in 1968? That movement, it, it fell like, like, like lightning from a clear blue sky. No warning. No warning, nothing. The, the workers were relatively quiet. Trade union membership in France was, was not more than four million, three and a half million, I think, because of the bankruptcy of the trade union leaders. Yes, but 10 million workers occupied the factories in a couple of days. Whole factories became organized. Whole factories, where there were no trade union. Trade unions were banned. I think it was the, I think it was the Citroen factory. They organized themselves. Thousands and thousands of workers poured into the unions. And there should have been a revolution in France and in Italy, there should have been a revolution. Now, history, history will repeat itself, my friends. 
But the question is, are we prepared for this? Are you personally prepared? Are you psychologically prepared for it? Not just talking about perspectives in general. You know, with these perspectives must mean something. There must be a guide to action. That's what perspectives are. The whole discussion shows that we are entering into an entirely different situation. The bourgeoisie is, 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 is extremely pessimistic now. I read The Economist the other day, I think it was yesterday, yesterday, I think. It warns of darkening economic skies and the coming threat of a bitter winter of discontent. That's their perspective. And it, it, it continues. It says, but look in almost any direction, almost any direction. And there are reasons to be concerned about chilling threats to the world economy in any direction, it says. In other words, the outlook of the bourgeois economists is extremely pessimistic. They see, they see the danger that, they, what I said at the beginning, the entire system is collapsing, is about to collapse around their ears. That's one side of the equation, one side of the picture. But you know, there is another side of the picture. In spite of all this, just think of the enormous wealth that is being created by the labor of the working class in recent decades. Colossal wealth, which if it were used properly, would be more than enough to solve all the problems of humanity. There'd be no more hunger, no more homelessness, no more people dying of elementary diseases. Let me just quantify that. In 1970, the world economy was only, only about 3 trillion in GDP. Now it's 30 times greater than 30 times greater than that. And in the next 30 years, they calculate, the bourgeois economists calculate, the global economy is again expected to more or less double. So by the year 2050, global GDP could be close to $180 trillion. That's on a capitalist basis. On the basis of a planned socialist economy, you could multiply, you could multiply these figures many times. But what, what do these figures mean? Think about it. It means, comrades, that there's absolutely nothing utopian about the perspectives of socialism, nothing at all. In reality, the material basis for, for a socialist world already exists. And just think of this. We have in our hands, the human race has in its hands, all that is necessary to build a paradise in this world, because there is no other, you know. You only live once, my friends. We only live once. And that's possible. This is a tantalizing vision before us, which we should never forget this. But the prior condition is the overthrow of the capitalist system. I think Comrade Serge said that uh, it's a choice between socialism or barbarism, of course. That is, that's, that's the only choice. And Comrade Ilva, and again, in a very good intervention, said something important, that big opportunities can present themselves before us. And this can happen far more quickly than we, we imagine. So comrades, to sum up this marvelous discussion, we must be prepared in the first place, politically, theoretically prepared with the ideas of Marxism. But that, that uh, preparation must, must lead to the building of an organization. Leon Trotsky, that great uh, revolutionary leader and martyr of the working class, once said, ideas without organization is like a knife without a blade. So that is the, the, that is the one central task. It's a responsibility for all of us. The preparations must take place right now. It's no good. It's no good. Yes. When, once the revolution begins, like in Sri Lanka, you haven't got an organization, it's, it's too late. And therefore, our, our task is an urgent one, and we must proceed with, with due urgency. And therefore, I, I appeal to all the comrades present at this school. My friend, if you're not already a member of the IMT, of the International Marxist Tendency, right now I'm asking you to join, if you agree with the ideas here, of course. We're serious people, and therefore we're based upon ideas. And I'll give you two good reasons why you should join us. First of all, we need you. We need your help to build the forces of revolutionary Marx, Marxism in your own country and internationally. But I'll give you another reason, even more important reason. You see, you also need us. You can't be an individual isolated atom as a Marxist. You have to be a member of a revolutionary organization. So 
on that note, I will finish what I think was a very successful session, opening session. I'm sure the others will be even better. I, I'd just like you to think of one thing, that there is nothing in your life, nothing in our lives, no cause more important than the building of the necessary instrument for changing society. Communists, let us build together a mighty organization of the working class, which is destined to lead the, the proletariat to overthrow this monstrous capitalist system and lead the human race out of the darkness and into the light of a higher form of human civilization, the World Socialist Federation.